The road to the 36th America's Cup has entered new territory. Get it up, get the bow up, get it ripping. It's on in some of the most challenging conditions we have seen to date. There's high drama and high speeds. These guys are going 40 knots in eight knots of breeze. How does that happen? 75. Plus moments of complete calmness. Both boats are Basically coasting. Ineos Team UK has become the team to beat in the Prada Cup round robin series. If anyone thought Ineos was going to have trouble, think again. They look strong. It's just been an incredible three days for this first round robin phase. And from where we were a couple of weeks ago, the team's pulled out just about every stop possible. Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli aren't far behind. Yep, yep, yep. Wow. Maintaining their lead with a mini splashdown. Ah, oh, we knew this was going to be hard, but this is brutal. The British are selling very well, but every race against them, we were very close. So we know that we can, we can beat them. And American magic is in the fight of their life. Wall here, wall here, wall here. On. American magic! The beauty of our team is there's a high level of resolve, and I think what we're gonna see over the next, you know, eight to 10 days is the boat get rebuilt, and we're gonna get back into racing. Kia ora and welcome to Tamaki Makaurau Aotearoa, Auckland, New Zealand, venue for the 36th America's Cup. It is a monster day in the Prada Cup Challenger Series. Ineos Team UK are 4 and 0. Oh. Sir Ben's Brigade are yet to drop a race and are poised to earn direct entry into the Prada Cup final. But to do so, they face Luna Rosa, a team with two decades of America's Cup experience. They have stated that today will be a great test, but for them, it's one race at a time. And it's all part of the process heading towards the match, beginning March 6 against defender Emirates Team New Zealand. Whoever finishes the round robin top goes to the Prada Cup final, while the remaining two challengers race in the first to four semi-final series. The winner of that then facing the top qualifier in the first to seven Prada Cup final. The winner then moves on to the match. So where are we right now? This is how it stands. Ineos in the box seat to advance directly to the Prada Cup final, needing two more wins. But as we saw last week with American Magic's near sinking, anything can happen. Today and tomorrow, round robins three and four have been adjusted due to the retirement of American Magic from the stage of racing. In effect, this weekend's a head-to-head -head between Enios and Luna Rossa. If Enios defeat Luna Rossa in the opening race and complete the ghost race against American Magic, they advance to the Prada Cup final. Luna Rossa must win both races today and tomorrow. If they do, the Italians earn direct entry to the Prada Cup final. So everything is on the line today for both campaigns. You get it? Well, to further clarify how this racing weekend will unfold without American Magic, let's hear from racing director Ian Murray. Uh, American Magic capsizing and withdrawing from the round robin has, has reduced the races left on the table from six to two. So that's the simple part of it. And of course that was meant to happen over Friday, Saturday and Sunday of this weekend. Um, so what that means is that you know, the important races to determine the winner of the, the round robins um, will come from Luna Rossa or, or Britannia and that will be determined by effectively the two races um, or maybe even the first race on Saturday if Britannia wins. So we still have the other four races on the schedule and we will be progressing into um, the boats turning up and being ready to start and actually start the race um, and then the race once it's clear that they've performed those duties will be determined and the point will be awarded to those boats which is as per the rules of the competition so you know we're now we seem to have adopted the the phrasing of ghost races for these races um, so they're not really races it's a matter of 
turning up, satisfying the rules and um, taking the point and moving on. So let's now explain all the scenarios this weekend. After rounds, Robins one and two. Enios Team UK lead on four points with Luna Ross on two. If Enios Team UK wins the first race today and gain a point from the first ghost race, they move to six points. For the Italians with a point from the second ghost race, they'll only have three points with just two points available tomorrow. So Enios Team UK cannot be beaten and tomorrow's races will have no effect on the result. Enios Team UK advance straight to the Prada Cup final. However, if Luna Rossa wins the first race today, they move to three. And with an extra point each from the ghost races, Enios Team UK will finish today with five, Luna Rossa with four. So tomorrow's races will decide things. In the first race tomorrow, if Enios Team UK win, they will move to six points. So even with points from the ghost races, Luna Rossa cannot gain enough points to overtake them, and Enios Team UK still advance to the final. The interesting scenario, however, is this. If the Italians can win the first race tomorrow, then they also move to five points. And with another point each from the ghost races, we finish with a six-point tie. In this case, the tie-break rules come into effect, which puts Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli at the top of the table due to their win in the last race between them. It's been an emotional six days in the Prada Cup following American Magic's capsize. All teams have been touched by what unfolded. We're going to address that shortly, but first up, Nathan Outeridge, Kenny Reid. How big a day today for these two challenges? I think it's a great day for everybody involved because they just want to get back sailboat racing again. There's so much has been made, rightfully so, about this incredibly dramatic capsize and the aftermath of it. But these are sailboat racers at heart, and that's what they're trained to do, Nathan. Yeah, exactly, and it actually feels like it's been a very long time since these boats were out on the water. The forecast, well, the breeze this week has been so strong, we haven't seen the teams doing much sailing, and I'm looking forward just to seeing the racing happening again today. Kenny, just briefly, who's under the most pressure here? Oh, Italians, 100%. It's, it's win or you lose this round-robin series, and you got to do a bunch more racing rather than developing. They want to oh. develop. All right, Kenny, as a member of the New York Yacht Club, I want to take us back to the capsize because I want, I want everybody to appreciate how you felt watching the capsize? Well, first of all, I, I felt for all the emotion of all the different uh, club members around the world. I know how invested they are mentally into this whole thing. Uh, secondly, I guess none of us have ever seen a boat breach like this before. Literally take off and go airborne. I, I think just the emotion of watching that happen it, it puts you immediately into this, uh, well, more importantly, like kind of a training mode. What, we're, what we as sailors are trained for, and that is the safety aspect. Boats come and go, sails come and go, parts and pieces come and go, but, but the 11 sailors on board cannot. They all have family and friends. I just remember going into head counting mode, and I, we were going through and getting to 11 because I want to let the people know in the position we're in right now that, that your father, your brother, your, your son is, is okay. And that's really the most important thing right now. And then of course there has to be, Nathan, the safety and the training aspect of all of this. Well, these guys do plenty of underwater training, as you can see here. This is American Magic. These guys train all the time for the underwater activities. You can see them here practicing using the spare air, the oxygen that they have strapped to them on board. They, when they're under the water, they practice taking off the life jackets in case they have to swim down and get out of it. And I've been involved in the last two America's Cups and we weren't allowed to go on the boat unless we passed these kind of tests. So if there's any question about does the America's Cup take, take this stuff seriously, they do and the teams are all over it and it's, it's a crucial part to any sailor on a boat like this. It's the same old mantra, preparation for everything. You can sort of cover yourself for the unexpected. You have to cover yourself in expected. You know, you've got to know where your knives are to cut yourself out if you need to, how to get your life jackets off, and it's got to be your natural instinct to get yourself out, out of these situations. And these guys are extremely prepared, and that is a very calming effect for family and friends and all attached to these campaigns. You know, they, the footage of Patriot going airborne, almost yeah, sinking and then rescued, has been watched over and over. But here's an angle of it you may not have viewed, and that comes from American Magic themselves. Racing against Luna Rosa today in the second round robin. It's fully in the cards to be able to win this one. So win this race gets us that good momentum and sets us up to keep winning and carry on.
<laughs> what I like about this team is that every day we go in the water, it's, uh, it's the same attitude, same kind of uh, mode of operation that we always have. So whether we come off after winning twice or losing twice, it's the same, and we set ourselves up, you know, to just keep doing what we know how to do. Should see more breeze today, which is definitely something the Patriot likes. So, you know, we all love it. Sailing more breeze, butts go a bit faster and spend more time, you know, foiling instead of wishing you were foiling. So, should be all on today. Full speed, go, 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 and we are underway. American Magic looks strong today. To me, it looks like they've got wheels. They've got a little bit of extra, both upwind and downwind. They are steaming on this race course. American Magic looking, hopefully, for their first win. One more down. American Magic flying into that gate for the final time. And it for Lyle Squall here. Essentially, the boat was dead. So with that, we were trying to tow her, and then it was taking a lot of time because the boat was not watertight anymore due to the damage. The boat was literally sinking. There should be more bags. There should be another one underneath there. Just watch the whisk and everything. Tighten it a little bit. And then just keep pumping everything. Are you copying? The team did an incredible job in the first half hour. I thought for sure the boat was going to sink. You know, when we started putting the airbags on the top of the mast so we could find the boat, you know, that's, a, that's an indication of what's taking place. And you can't give enough thanks to the local police and the local fire and the local authorities for their quick response. Huge thanks to Team New Zealand, to Inos and Luna Rosa for coming out and supporting us. You know, it was, it was truly a, um, a full team effort. <laughs> Thank you. 
It all happened so fast. Like you, you're aware of the risks in that manoeuvre, and we got through the first half, and it kind of felt like we were under control. We didn't quite get through the power zone fast enough, which is always going to be the case when it's that windy. I think what we can take away is how well the boat was going. We were ripping in that last race. Everybody was brought it all back together. We've had a tough couple of days, and we all came together. We had a, we were having a great race, and uh, that's what we've got to look to, get the boat back on the water, get it all back in one piece, and, and go and do what we're here to do. We've all been sailing really well today. We need to get back into it, and, uh, and just hopefully they can weave some magic in the, in the shed this next week or so. I think it's bent. Oh, bent. Is it bent? Yeah, I think it's just bent, broken. I don't think it's actually any indication. Of the ship. You know, obviously, um, not exactly the end of the day that we wanted, but you know, the boat was going really well today, and it's, you know, I can't help but think it's a sign of things to come when we get her back out there. But what an incredible effort by everybody in this room to get the boat back to the dock. Time and time again, when you look at our history for the last three years. All we've done is answered the question whenever it got hard, we just kind of keep chipping along at it. You know, our greatest strength in this whole regatta is everybody in this room. So if we rely on each other and we back each other and we support each other, we won't go wrong. So let's not give in to that because of this, because this can be fixed. You know, we have the skill in this room to do that. And, you know, we should just do what we have to do to get it done, because it's going to make for one hell of a story. Patriots, a big moment through their eyes, but Kenny, it never gets easy for those watching. Oh my goodness, the raw emotion. It, it, it's, it's not the sailors. The sailors get the attention. It's the families, it's the friends, it's the supporters, but it's especially all those people back in the shed who help put these boats back together again. Goodness gracious, that, that is something else. Yeah, it's, it's a big um, emotional event for friends and families. I, actually bumped into a few of the sailors' partners on, on the way home after racing, and you could see the shock in their eyes, but you could see how thankful they were that everyone was okay. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a big team effort to get these boats back together. Yeah, and you can just imagine the emotional toll this event has taken on the whole New York Yacht Club campaign. But front and centre is skipper Terry Hutchinson, who's been chasing his cup dream for over 20 years. He was kind enough to give us his time and relive the capsize all over again. He follows Golden Speed here for the tech, 20 to boundary. 40 seconds before the top mark, we're sailing along in about 12 knots of wind and everything's pretty benign. Heading towards the top gate for the last time, 35 knots, American Magic. This will be a huge weight off the shoulders. About 20 seconds before the left turn, the you know, breeze comes up to 16, 17, and you can hear the audio on board, and the breeze goes left, so you hear a little bit of, of high pitch from you know, easing the jib. As we go into the maneuver, you know, Dean makes a clear call, left turn. He'll stay to leeward for the bear away. And as we go to bear away, basically you know, about a 23 and a half knot puff drop down on top of us. And over she went. Oh, hang on here. American magic. My and goodness. They are over. Take a size. Take a size. No, no, no. My, my most vivid memory is, is when I heard Dean say, uh, I've lost the rudder. Oh, I've lost the rudder here. Yeah. I basically, you know, I'm clipped into the boat, so I went to eject myself out of the boat, and my my clip didn't come undone, um, which straight away got my cackles up, and uh, so then I went for the knife, and the cockpit filled yep. up straight away and it very quickly went from yep. everything's in okay to uh, a high, a pretty high fever from my perspective as I straight away was underwater and pinned underneath the mainsail. As Sicho went by me, he could see that my head was underwater and, my, and that I was trapped. Cooper grabbed his knife and um, 
cut the left one and got me out. From there, all four of us popped out from underneath the mainsail and did the head count and we were all, you know, everybody was safe. We counted all 11 people. So it looked like all people were accounted for, all 11 crew members. You know, very quickly, it became apparent that Patriot was, had suffered some major damage. And when we got her upright, uh, it was clear that there was a hole. And it very quickly went to a, um, a rescue operation of the boat. At the time, it felt like um, you know, we had one air pocket in the boat um, that was keeping her afloat. I think uh, we all thought the boat was going to sink. When, when Geese raised the orange buoy to the top of the mast, um, that, that to me is like a telltale sign that, uh, and he's one of, the, one of the boat captains, you know, that's a telltale sign that he's preparing for something that is uh, inevitable. So at what point did we realize there was a hole? I think it was within the first three minutes when um, Chase 3 picked up a piece of floating carbon. Uh, what caused a hole is that there's some transverse structure in the bow of the boat that, you know, the impact of the hull to the water was quite significant. And basically that structure guillotines the panel out of the boat. It's going to be a hard maneuver. It's going to be a real hard maneuver. Heading counter three, two, one. Heading down now. Heading down now. Heading down now. Three, two, one. Heading down now. In that situation, the boat you know, the boat's designed for a certain amount of impact, but having watched and looked at the pictures, I can tell you we were well beyond the threshold. <laughs> uh, from a team perspective and the, the actual saving of Patriot, you know, we had pumps on the water, we have uh, floats on the water, we have basically everything you need um, to keep the boat uh, from sinking in a worst case scenario. And I would say in retrospect, um, we were probably a bit underprepared. And we had, you know, and I say that only because we ended up with 16 pumps in the boat. We put six of our pumps in the boat. Uh, it wasn't enough. We attached all of our marks to the bow and to the stern of the boat. And that would have kept the, that would have kept her, you know, had she actually gone underneath the surface. I mean, well, she was, but had she gone completely under, it would have, the boat would have floated you know, a meter below the surface with everything that we had. As we, as we uh, later understood it a little bit more, we only needed enough to float about four tons, and we had more than that to keep the boat, you know, with the buoyancy of the water as well. You know, we received some incredible support from the New Zealand authorities, from the fire and rescue. The local authorities showed up with pumps. You know, we received incredible support from Un you know, truly unbelievable support from Team New Zealand, from Inos and Luna Rosa. There was a uh, level of, of support from the other teams that uh, is, is a great testament to sportsmanship, to kind of the, you know, this mentality that we're all in it together, which we are. I think I have an overwhelming sense of pride, not only in how our team handled the situation, but how the sailing community here in New Zealand handled the situation. The infrastructure that they have in place on the water from a Auckland uh, community perspective was bang on. It was hard because, you know, we have three years invested into um, into this boat. We have all this support of these great people. We have incredible support from Hap Falf and Doug DeVos and Roger Penske and the New York Yacht Club. And, you know, so I think when you're in that situation, you quickly realize uh, it's not gonna be the first mistake that gets you. As it is when we race, it's always gonna be the second one. And what the team did an incredible job at was recognizing we couldn't, we couldn't bring her back home bow first, so we had to go in reverse, and we kept the water out of the boat. Um, we made uh, the priority to make sure that our team and our family was safe. Um, and the, yeah, and then when we got back to, you know, we got back to shore, um, you know, we had a good plan to get the rig out, to get the boat out of the water, and we had a good team meeting inside the shed, and, 
And then I think one of the strengths of American Magic and of our team as a whole is the people. And from here on out, you know, we just allow the people to do their jobs and you know, not, not overcomplicate the process, uh, understand what needs to be taken um, and needs to be done, and then allow it all to happen. And that's, you know, sitting here today, that's what we're doing. Right now, you could probably drive your car into the, uh, into the hole that's in the side of the boat. Small car, but a car nonetheless. But thankfully, um, we have great Boat One and Defiant sitting out in the forecourt that they've taken some of the componentry out of and some of the structure out of Defiant. We've had great support from, the, from Team New Zealand and their boat building facility, and they're helping us out with um, some of the, the bigger, the flat panel that gets attached to, that's basically getting rebuilt off the mold that we have. Our boat building uh, team is taking care of the structure inside the yacht. Uh, the electronics department is taking care of all the um, electronics and that everything's been pulled out of the boat. Everything's been tested. We know exactly what has to go back into the boat and what's new and what's not new. And so, you know, we're making great progress almost every hour. I think our determination is, is to win the regatta. That's our determination. Um, our expectation is the boat's gonna go back in the water and it's gonna be same, same as it was last Sunday, you know, a minute before uh, we, we tipped her over. And you know, we had three pretty horrendous days in a row. <laughs> and, you know, if that's, I don't think any of us are gonna let, let those three days beat us. I'm not, um, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go sailing tomorrow and when we get the boat back from the, from the shore team, we'll be ready to go. American Magic's Terry Hutchinson showing us the human side of this event and just showing also the passion as to why these sailors and all the crew around them do what they do. But you know, there've been many questions as to why Patriot capsized. So, we're going to break it down for using our incredible technology. 10 onboard cameras, 12 microphones, 4 on crew members, 2 helicopters, 3D graphics, and of course, Nathan and Kenny, who have it all on hand to help you understand. Kenny? Let's just set this whole thing up for our audience at home, Nathan. In the bottom left-hand corner of the screen is what we call a gate, and that's where these boats have to travel through. They're either going to do what's called a tack bear away. Remember, the mark is downwind, but they're gonna do a tack bear away and head toward the finish line, or they're going to do a bear away jibe and head to back towards the finish line. The reason why they have to do a tack or a jibe is because the wind is running in this direction approximately. You can't sail into or directly with the wind, so you have to kind of zigzag around. So here we go, we're setting this thing up, and Nathan, what's going on? So American Magic have a large lead over Luna Rossa Prada Prelli, about a 480 meter lead, and they're coming to this mark discussing, are they gonna do the left turn, which is the tack bear away, or are they gonna do the right turn, which would be a bear away jive? As we see, they're gonna do a tack bear away, but we also see really dark water in this area here. We always talk about dark water versus light water. Uh, light water meaning not as, you know, there isn't as, as many ripples on the water from a big puff. And we know now that it's blowing twice as hard. It goes from 12 to 24 knots of wind speed as this maneuver is trying to happen. Let's maybe go on board and take a, take a good uh, hear of the comms on board because that's really the setup that tells us as much about anything. You bench at this angle. Yeah, copy that. Yeah. It's all about just staying to the left here for this pressure. All right, we start to stop for a second, please. Right. And let's just set up who these people are. Paul Goodison just said, let's stay to the left for this pressure. Dean Barker, the helmsman. Terry Hutchinson, the tactician. And way forward up on this side, kind of out of view of the whole left-hand side of the race course is Andrew Campbell, who's the flight controller. But clearly the four of them are in the comms loop. Yeah, these four guys are always discussing what they do in the races. And this is a really interesting setup to what happens at the top, Mark. So let's just have a listen to the, the chat on board. Yeah, copy. You need to get back in the free the left side of the course, though. Yeah, copy that. All soft the loop. Hold for a second. That was Andrew Campbell saying, all soft to lured 
But he's saying that the, the mark on the right-hand side, the mark on this side of the boat, is actually 100 meters closer to, to the just down the racetrack, right? It's just 100 meters less distance. If you take this one, you do 100 meters less distance, which, you know, is generally a good thing in these racing. Okay. And even with a, uh, the tech, uh, 100 meters. Yeah, copy. Really nice puff here. It'll be quite hot coming back to the front. You're wide here, Dan. Please, please, please. Big, 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 big chip, big on the chip. Okay, we'll hold it there for a second. Explain to him what's going on in this high-speed boat coming into the weather gate at 40-plus knots, I well, might add. Exactly. You hear Dean Barker say there's a big, nice puff coming here, so get ready for the puff. So he's identified the puff is coming. When it hits, Paul Goodison shouts, big ease, big ease. And everyone's like, well, why would Paul Goodison say ease? Isn't he the one trimming the sails? Well, he's trimming the traveller and the main sheet, but he's not trimming the jib. He's let the main out so far because of the increase in pressure and the wind shift to the left, that the jib's now backwinding the main. And, you know, anyone who sailed boats knows when the, when the main's out and the jib's on, the main flaps, and you can't depower without either turning up, which they can't because of the marks, or easing the jib. There we go. I think there's a spot to move a away guy, Ben. Okay, hold there for a second. That's Goodison, back of the boat. He's the guy that really sees this pressure. Uh, he says, smarter move to bear away jibe. So, so he's just saying, you know, if we just bear away in the front of the pressure and then jibe afterwards, it's a smarter, safer maneuver. That's what he's trying to get across. Right-hand turn. Right-hand turn. Not much time to explain it. So he's just trying to use small, sharp words. And you can see Dean Barker turns and looks at him. Maybe he hasn't heard him properly or not, but they're trying to have a little eye to eye here right now to, to make this final call. I think that's a key part of this, by the way, Dean, turning around. He's like... Are, are you sure you we're kind of switching our plan in his mind? He's looking at Goody right now saying that's a that's a plan switcher, right? That's what you, that's what you're implying right it's now. That's exactly what that look means is, well, hang on. We're always going left. What do you mean? Right. And in the end, he reverts as we listen here and says, no, nah, stick to plan A. OK. OK, we'll hold that for a second. Essentially, Dean kind of overrode that. So, so you had Goodison saying, safe maneuver is going to the right. It's going to be really hard. This is a really hard maneuver. He says it twice. This is a really hard maneuver, saying it twice. He, he doesn't ever say, don't do it. Clearly, the way these guys are set up is Barker has the last call. Yeah, 100%. You know, it looks like Barker has the last call. And, and Goody was not nervous, but he was elevated in his voice. He could sense that there was a situation developing here, I think, and trying to get everyone in tune. Okay. Not much else to say there. Not much else to say there, ex <laughs> except there wasn't a whole lot of main sheet to be eased, unfortunately. Yeah, well, let's take a quick peek at this. The, here's here's the main sheet right here. The 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 traveler, which is which is the the on this track. So I, that is absolutely at the bottom end. The main sheet gets eased. We estimate maybe a hundred mil. They sail around right around in this area here. Uh, and, and there's, there's only about that much ease, which we think is about, you know, six, eight inches, something like that. Yeah. Not a huge ease. Not a huge ease for, for such a windy bear away. Let's go for another view this time from the side, from the chase boat. As we come around the mark, we're going to see some reasons why the boat lost control. Okay. So the first one here is they're rolling into attack. The tack, as we said, was a very nice tack. You know, they kept it falling the whole way through. But what happens on exit is the main is hung up, it's eased, and it's stuck on that leeward backstay. If we just pause very briefly, we can see up here, leeward and windward backstay. So this is the leeward backstay. The sail up here is pinned on it, which means they can't depower the boat any further. Backstays are necessary because they hold the mast up, they bend the mast, they control the jib shape. So the And the leeward side, that's the bottom side, the side away from the wind, that's supposed to be loose. That shroud's supposed to be loose. That backstay's supposed to be loose, and it's not. So then what happens is massive heel occurs, and then the rudder pops out of the water at the back, and you see all that white water come off the back of the rudder? That's when Dean Bucker says, I've lost control. 
that's when the heels created, the boat pops up in the air, and then the boat lays over on its side because, again, they can't ease the sails out. Let's see why the thing spun around and, and actually laid over on its side. We're going to take a look from the helicopter view from the back of the boat, and this is actually shows something really dramatic. The boat, we'll stop it there. The boat is under, it seems to be reasonably under control. It's starting to heal a little bit. That's not a good thing, but it's going straight, and, and you'll know what I mean in a second here because all boats are meant to go straight, first of all, but as we play it forward really slowly, once the boat catches air, the mainsail spins the boat towards the wind as we're going forward, and let's hold it right there. The boat actually turns in the air almost 45 degrees, and so it, it was heading this way, and now it's heading that way. When it comes down on its side, it crashes on a part of the hull that is not made for this sort of brute force. The brute force is created fore and aft from the bow to the stern. When you land on the side, that's when you're gonna do some massive damage and that's exactly what happened in this case. So that was the capsize and then the dramatic rescue operation. The first things first, Kenny, getting the boat back upright. Getting it upright because the boat is actually designed, we've seen in a couple capsizes down here in Auckland so far, the boat is actually designed to right itself, to self-right, but something was dramatically wrong. As soon as it popped up in the air, we said on air, oh my goodness, this is floating really low. And we didn't really know until the boat came upright, at least from our vantage point, that the boat was taking on water, but they did know. They, the, the sailors themselves say they did know that it was starting to fill up, Nathan. They did, they, they identified, you can see there, they're trying to fix that hole that was in the bow. So they've got a team of people on board pumping the water out, a team of people trying to, to fix that hole to, to stop the water continually going in. Meanwhile, you've got a team of people around trying to put flotation on the boat to keep it afloat. Now the bags there are around, are, they're trying to trap the hole. They're trying to get the pumps to work. The pumps aren't gonna work if water is coming in the hole as fast as you're pumping it back overboard again. So you need to get something around that hole, and that's what those bags are made for. They had up to 16 pumps at one time pumping water out of this. One great thing is that the boat doesn't have a big keel. Some of the, some of the boats that I've sailed that had a couple issues on, like sinking one out in Long Beach once, uh, had 20 tons of lead on the bottom of the keel. These boats don't, they're inherently light, so they're, you have a little bit more time, a little bit more opportunity to save it, and that's exactly what happened with the help of all their friends. And that's the most important thing. Mariners looking after Mariners, regardless of how competitive this is, Nathan, you look after each other. Well, it's, a, it's one big community. All these sailors, designers, shore crew, they've all worked on different teams. Everyone in this community are good mates with each other and, and they stood there until dark, you know, helping the team get home, bringing dinner out to them so they had some food to eat. And, you know, it's, it's a big effort and, you know, I think everyone, breathed a huge sigh of relief when the boat got back to the dock and came out. We call it the sailor's code. You know, you you, you battle like crazy on the water for, for the right to hold a trophy over your head. But the bottom line is we're all worried about each other's safety and we're there for each other in the end. And, you know, when you think of these campsites, it's all part of the sailors and designers pushing the limits of technology that's available to them at the time. So we're going to just take you back to some of them. Let's start, first of all, with One Australia in, in uh, 1995, because, man, that was a dramatic one, Kenny. Now, there seems a problem on One Australia. See, the backstay's gone loose and the forestay. There is definitely a problem aboard One Australia. The great Peter Montgomery telling to the world that this boat had split in half. I was hundreds of meters away, actually practicing on, on Young America that day. And uh, this was this sent shivers through the entire sailing world. Nobody had ever seen anything like this. 2,000 feet of water, that boat is long gone. Yes, but then, uh, what was it, five years later in Auckland, uh, uh, Young America... Um, young America goes down. Look at young America. Not good luck for the name it's Young America, but that's for sure. This thing split in half, very similar way, under-engineered, obviously in a certain spot. The four and a half loads crumpled the boat. This boat did not sink. The outer skin stayed together, and they actually got this boat back on the race course a few weeks later, amazingly enough. And then three years later, we go to 2003, and not the boat, the mast this time. Everything is built on the edge. Everything. Carbon fiber, titanium, all these materials, at some stage in the development of all these boats, these materials were brand new. So it's really, we're, we're trying things that have never been done before. 
And then, Nathan, we go to 2013 and the falling generation is upon us and hydraulics. This is the AC-72. These are big, powerful boats powered by these massive wing sails. To pop the wing there on Emirates Team New Zealand, they need hydraulic pressure. In this instance, they didn't get enough hydraulic pressure and the wing didn't pop. Four years later, Emirates Team New Zealand, big nosedive before the start, but it came out okay. Well, it was a downspeed fairway, rudders popped out of the water and it was a huge nosedive. And this was in the semi-finals in Bermuda. I was racing on this day, couldn't believe my eyes when it happened, but the damage was substantial and the guys just worked night and day and they had that boat ready to go in I think it was 24 hours the boat was ready to go and get back into racing and shows you how important the whole team is. And then we go back just a week ago out on the Hauraki Gulf, the Waitamata Harbour and Patriot. Well, the faster the boat goes, the bigger the crashes are. And this was a huge crash we saw last weekend and plenty of drama in the America's Cup. So as you can see, capsize and sinking are nothing new. It's all about the amazing evolution of sailing and pushing it to the limits because that's what sailors like to do. There she is, Mangawika North Head. Let's remind you, we're 16 minutes and less to racing in round robin three, race number two. And Britannia will be gunning for the critical win against Luna Rossa in the opening race. And then both teams must start the ghost races to earn the points that have always been on offer. The Prada Cup round robin might be a two-boat race, but it is far from over. The Italian syndicate want a win, and they want to push hard, but they are acutely aware there is no room for mistakes. Well, this weekend, obviously, is our first final because uh, we basically need to win, uh, well, mainly the first race to to, to break even and then uh, and then if we are good enough to win the first uh, race we need to win another race and going straight to the final which is I think key and important mainly because you will have more time to prepare uh, the final of the Prada Cup uh, what you are missing all the time in the America's Cup is time and having the chance to to have uh, an extra week uh, where you can control uh, your time is, uh, is key at this uh, point of the campaign if anyone thought any else was going to have trouble, think again, it truly is game on in the Prada Cup. As I said many times in the press conference, when everyone was giving up already, Ben and his team, I said, well, you guys don't know Ben and the people involved in the team. I knew the level of the team uh, during the Christmas Cup was not the real level of the team. We all know Ben is probably one of the greatest sailors in the planet and Giles as well is going to be the future guy no? and the team the sailors they got the board are pretty good so we know we got pressure on because obviously they got too much points but uh, we need to just fight until the end and make one mistake uh, less than them. Everyone here at the base is pretty confident but we also know if we're going to lose uh, we're going to lose and we need to think already to the next uh, step which is American Magic. I'm sure they will uh, get back, probably stronger than before, because when you climb up uh, from something like that, you, you, you have even more power than before. No? For sure they are, they are facing a big challenge, but uh, they're going to come out uh, from that. In a certain wind range, it's probably the fastest boat compared to the three of us. But as I said, when we saw the capsize of Team New Zealand months ago, uh, I said already there, it's not gonna be the last one. More you race, more you will push the boat. And everyone here wants to stay ahead. So for sure, you can argue they could do something different, but after it's always easy. But when you are ahead, you wanna stay ahead. So you push it pretty hard. And uh, I would be no surprise if we're gonna see another thing like that. Hopefully not, but, uh, but we need to be ready. And, uh, and uh, it's part of the game. Okay. Up, stay up, stay up. Obviously, the first goal of our campaign is to get to the final of the Prada Cup, and we will do our best to, to achieve that because at the end, uh, we, we work for more than three years to get there. And think step by step. I, I don't think we need to think about the Cup or whatever. Now, now the first real final of our campaign is uh, this Saturday race.
It makes a glorious sight, does it not? That is uh, looking from the North Shore and the Takapuna and Lake Pupuki as we get ready for racing and this big day out. So can you read a big day for Luna Ross and Max Serena? They're under the pump a little bit, aren't they? Well, Max Serena is listed as the skipper of the team, but really in this case, he's kind of the CEO. He hasn't been on board yet, but he's very clearly involved in all the aspects of the, of the program. I think behind closed doors, this team doesn't think they've sailed that well yet. You know, they have two wins, but both of those wins were against a boat that didn't even finish the race. So I think they got a lot to play for today. Let's go to the other side and the opposition as we look at the spectator fleet out looking forward to this race. Subban Ainsley knows all about triumph over adversity, but just look at the recent World Series. In his words, really poor preparation for the Prada Cup. No wins and a constant struggle, but lessons have been learned and the team is mindful you cannot throw caution to the wind. Got water in that boat. That boat is really low in the water right now. Something has gone badly wrong with Patriot. I think the American Magic capsize was a wake up call for all of us. You know, we push this boat really hard, and obviously, you know, those are the consequences if you push it just that little bit too hard. When the breeze is up, it's a reminder to first and foremost keep the boat in balance and under control. After that, it's changed things in terms of the points required to win the round robins and get through direct to the Prada Cup final. And it's just up the intensity in terms of the racing that we will have with Luna Rosa over this coming weekend, up the intensity, the importance of winning those races. Clearing transom to one now. Luna Rosa have been involved in the America's Cup since 2000. So they've been in the game 20 odd years. Very, very experienced outfit. They've got great designers, great sailors, fantastic backing from Patricio Bertelli and the Prada brand. And they're really iconic, I think, when it comes to the America's Cup. That said, there are competitors, we want to beat them, and we'll be trying our, our hardest this weekend to get that route through to the final. Very nice there, yeah, good gains. For us, we just have to take each race at a time. And, you know, if we don't have a good race on Saturday, we'll have to come back on Sunday and, and try again. But really, you just, we've just got to keep the intensity going. OK, awesome hustle, guys. Well done, nice. guys. Any us, Team UK, they go 4-0 and oh in the Prada Cup Challenger Series. It's been quite a long period now that we've been down here in, in Auckland, three months, and that momentum's slowly been building. Um, we've had our ups and our downs, and certainly last weekend was a real up for the team, a great motivator, and you can feel that momentum growing. So actually, I, I see that we are able to capitalise on that and hopefully keep that rolling through this weekend. But, you know, it's never easy in this game and we don't expect it to be easy. So we'll, we'll always fight all the way. They're manoeuvres that we've just never seen them this smooth. Uh, something has drastically changed under the water to make these manoeuvres so smooth. Well, the benefits of getting straight into the Prada Cup final, it just buys you time. And we all know in this game, time's everything. So it buys you a bit of extra time to maybe make some tweaks that you perhaps wouldn't otherwise get the opportunity. If you don't make it through to that final, you're into the repechage or the semi-final, which starts you know, four or five days later. And so it really narrows down any development time you've got. So that's why it's so important to try and make it through straight to the, to the Prada Cup final and give yourself a couple of weeks breathing space to make the developments and hopefully make some more gains in boat speed. Maunghuika North Head overlooking race course C, the stadium course, Enios Team UK, Nathan Outeridge, they are in a very strong position. They're oozing a quiet confidence with momentum on their side. Yeah, they've got huge momentum. They're undefeated. They've won every race they've competed in this year. And who would have thought after what they went through in December last year they could turn it around? But one thing that I've learned sailing against ben, ben Ainsley quite a lot over the last few years is that you don't want to give that guy a sniff. If he has a sniff of victory, he will make the most of it. And um, he, along with the whole team and the designers, have done a fantastic job to make that boat quicker and can't wait to see the, today's race. 
Robin 3, race 2, and the Italian syndicate with everything to sail for. Well, let's get back to boat racing. Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli has two points on the board and need a win to extend the series to tomorrow. And there are two matches to date. The Ineos Afterguard has engineered better timing and strategy, winning their first meeting right off the start and accomplishing a comeback win in their second meeting. Let's not forget that today's course has offered a distinct advantage to the boat that wins the start and that first cross. Spithill and Bruni need to be sharp off the line and simply concentrate on the task at hand. We have to just think about this race and win this race because ultimately, if we don't, we go straight to the semis. So, um, you know, especially with the new generation guys on board, um, I've told them, you know, we've got to win two straight. I said, that's an easy task. I've had to, me and Jimmy, you know, we had to win eight straight in San Francisco. So, but the only way to do that is literally process each race as its own. And I know the guys are super focused on going out today and just getting that point on the board. And tomorrow's another day. Britannia, can they take the next big step? Well, Enios Team UK had a fantastic first weekend in the Prada Cup. And now they're in the box seat to advance to the Prada Cup final. They've shown much improved boat speed, which allowed Ben Ainsley and tactician Giles Scott to get their heads out of the boat and make some smart race decisions on the race course. The team is clearly confident, and so they should be. They're undefeated after all. Well, today's the day. If they win this race, they book themselves in a spot to the Prada Cup final. We're pretty confident. I think um, the guys have been sailing really well, especially Ben and Giles, and the way our boat's set up has lent itself to that. It's been pretty hard to know, honestly, about boat speed, whether we're faster or slower, because um, it has been such a strange bunch of conditions and it's been shifty and land breezes. But, I don't think we're slower, so I'm confident going into today we'll be able to get the job done. Well, today we move back into the harbour and onto Stadium Course C. Shifty conditions often prevail on this course, tending towards a right side bias. The yacht start upwind with three laps to go, upwind and downwind. Breeze averaging almost 17 knots right now from the southwest with flat seas. Each leg is 1.93 nautical miles and the boundaries remain only a half a mile from side to side. A super tight racetrack at these speeds. And out onto race course, see the stadium course where our very own Shirley Robinson is out there on chase one. You cannot underestimate how big today is, Shirley. Oh, Stephen, it is a big day and lots of spectators are out to watch this impending battle. And let's not forget, both of these teams have come here with one thing on their minds, and that one thing is to win the America's Cup. Winning the round robin is a big step on that still very long road. They may be playing it down to the outside world, but both of these teams want this springboard, this buy straight into the Prada Cup final. So there'll be no quarter given out here this afternoon. It's sunny, there's good breeze, and some of the best tactical minds in sailing are about to go head to head on this tricky racetrack. I've said it a few times before, Stephen, but buckle up everybody. This is gonna be edge of your seat sailing. So here we go, round robin three, race two. It's Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli against Ineos Team UK. Strong crowds on the land in the America's Cup village. But how strong are the winds today? Kenny, <laughs> Kenny Reid and Nathan Alderidge because they're not quite, quite relaxed out there, both teams. Well, I don't think they're relaxed even in a little bit right now. Uh, it's breezy again. and. The capsize, we keep talking about the capsize. We're going to have to leave the capsize, Nathan, at some stage. But it's got to be fresh on the minds of all these guys. As they're ripping around at Mach 20 around the race course, they have to be thinking, hey, how much of this is preservation of the assets at the same time? Preservations of the people. It's got to be a little mixed message right now on board, maybe. 
Okay, yeah, I'm not so sure. You know Ben Ainsley, you know Jimmy Spittle, <laughs> Francesco Bruni. These guys are true racers. And for them, I think that was a few week, a week ago. And the wind is different direction. We don't have those frontal systems coming through. It's it's southwest. It's it's puffy and patchy out there. I've been following observations here and we've been chatting with Shirley before the start. And it's anywhere between 12 and 18 knots. So it's, it's going to be a... A, a yeah, tacticians race, be, I think, this one. When we talk about tacticians, the last time these two raced was an 18 second win to Enios Team UK back in uh, round robin yeah, two, race number two. And that was the one we, t we called, or you guys called, that was Giles Scott's race. It was Giles Scott's race, for sure. Their afterguard is Always set up. And it's it, it's uh, talked about around the world of sailing right now, how the different afterguards are set up on all the different boats. These guys have very purposely kept him away from any sort of grinding or physical duties, so his eyes are outside the boat 100% of the time. It's definitely come into play in these shifty conditions because we're sailing up near the land all the time, and it's really kind of makes sense if you think about it. And that's what Ben Ainsley said at the press conference about the design of Britannia and where their grinders were compromising two grinders so quote i think the quote was to get giles head out of the boat well, we all know nathan right now tactician has a hard time if they can't see the water and seeing the water and for, for those non-sailors seeing the water you can actually see puffs and if you really get down to it you can actually see the direction of a puff coming on the water it's not as invisible as you would think and these guys are the best in the world at it Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli will have port entry. They are allowed to enter at 2 minutes and 10 seconds into the starting area. And this is where it'll be arms out, Nathan. I'm really looking forward to this this battle here prior to the start. Yeah, the, the pre-start is always where the best action is. That's where the boats go toe to toe. And that's where they're going to be fighting for a particular end of the line. You know, we as commentators are in the box. We don't know which end of the line's favoured, but I bet you they have game plans. and. We'll bring you the pictures and we'll tell you what we think, but these guys are the ones who are racing and we'll be listening to hear what their thoughts are for the race. What's your gut, Nathan? Do you think this is a little uh, little punch out in the in the pre-start? Do you think they stay away from each other and, get in, and try to play out? I don't think they're staying away from each other in this one. Pressure coming on now. Here we go. Luna Rosa, Prada Pirelli into the starting area in this critical set up for round robin three race number two they need to Bring win down straight shots. this is the race committee we will be postponing the start stand by for further instructions so we just heard on board the race directors vote that they are post even though the boats came into the starting area they have the ability to postpone the start it looks like there was a big wind shift to the right nathan and they think this course would, would have been too skewed yeah big right hand shift means that when you go up the course on starboard take off the line you're almost laying the top mark so you know the, the goal of the race officer here in Murray is to keep the boat square to the breeze and Sure, it's pretty shifty out there. Is that big right-hand shift evident across the whole course? Yeah, Nathan, it's really shifting. In the last 10 minutes, it's taken you know, a big dive to the right-hand side at least sort of 20 degrees. And Ian Murray's been trying to get the course lined up, trying to move those top marks to the right-hand side of the course but they're just not in position yet. I don't think this will be a long delay. It, you know, he's nearly there, um, but absolutely the right call. The wind's also picked up a bit now. It's, it's probably 16, 18 knots, and as it's got a bit sunnier, it feels a little bit stronger out here. You do feel like, quote, the wind has been taken out of your sails when you get a postponement just as a boat's about to enter the pre-start area. I mean, the anticipation on all of these teams, particularly the Helmsman, must have been incredibly immense. Well, it seems like forever since we saw a boat race, you know, and, and, and we all know what we have been talking about for the past week for all the right reasons, but boat race is a boat race. Let's, let's go. I, I totally understand what Ian Murray's doing here. He's trying to make a fair racetrack for all involved, and... Uh, and we'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it very shortly. These things usually take uh, uh, not too long to kind of move those top, those that top gate over to the right, and um, and start it back up again. There, 
Panthers, Ineos, Team UK, Britannia, Ben Ainsley on the helm, and they must be champing at the bit. They are, they are basically one real win and a ghost win away from going straight to the Prada Cup final. And all those three years, Kenny, of uh, just money spent, hundreds of thousands of hours on boat design, boat building, just the whole nine yards is sitting. They're on the cusp. Well, three years is a long time for all these projects. Uh, who would have guessed a month ago that we would be talking about this boat being undefeated and ready to be the top seed going into the Prada Cup Finals. It, it, it's an incredible feat in its own right. Shirley, what's up with Enios right now? Well, I don't think anything's up with them, Stephen, but I'm hearing a lot of chat from on board about changing the jib. As you spotted, the wind has got up a bit and, and the window for each of, each of the jib choices is really small it's really fine so they're trying to work out if they've got enough time to change the jib it takes them you know between five and ten minutes depending on on how it goes so yeah big priority on that boat and i suspect on prada they're having the same debate could you give us an indication as how long we might be waiting because you're amongst it all for this restart <laughs> put me on the spot stephen MacGyver. um I don't know. I mean, it takes a little while to move the top gates, but but they're on their way. Uh, and it has been a, a big right-hand shift. That this was not forecast. Um, it's going to be an interesting course, and it'd be good to get Nathan's take on it. You know, the breeze is coming from the right-hand side of North Head. We've not actually seen that before. It's slack tide. It's, it's the same racetrack, but yet different to what we've seen in previous races. Thank you, Shirley. That's Shirley Robertson and Chase Boat One, two-time Olympic gold medalist. We have the best experts running around, so we're on a race postponement because of big right-hand shift. Huh? Yeah. We, so uh, here's the, the, the so graphics. You can see there the, the arrows coming down the screen. That's the wind direction. You can see how it isn't in line with, with the race course. And when it's shifted so far to the right like this, now the wind's going to be coming over North Head. It's coming over a lot more land. It's going to be very puffy. And so Ian Murray, you know, did the right thing. He wants to straighten that course up, give these guys a fair race. I think he knows how important today's racing is. And he doesn't want to have sailors and teams coming to him after the racing complaining that he didn't set a fair race course. He's got a little time, too. You know, there, it isn't a multi-race day. So he's got a little bit more time than normal. And uh, let's, get it, let's get it set up right. The world, uh, the world can wait a few more minutes for this these really cool boats and this uh, really intense boat race to actually happen. So that is the stadium course, as you see it, to the right of your screen. Uh, there's Mungawika North Head, and you can see the spectator fleet sort of just comfortably in, 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 the, in the soft spot, but you can see the wind too coming from the right to left on your screen, as Nathan quite rightly said, over the land. And it's a big right shift that has caused this postponement at the moment of Round Robin 3 race number two well we've had you know between 240 and 210 wind direction we're now right around at 270 that's a big right hand shift and um you know that wasn't predicted in any of the forecast models that i've been following today and ian murray obviously didn't expect it either so as you say sailing is a is a sport that you have to work around the weather and um these things happen. It's it's just a quick rejig of the course, and we should be going again in 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, so let's let's just quickly go down this path. If folks are joining in around the world watching this, and they're going, well, okay, there's been a wind shift, and and they're going to reset the course. If they had continued on in the current conditions, what might have we seen? Well, it becomes a bit of a drag race, a bit of a parade around the racetrack. The feature of these courses that make them work, that make them so uh, hard for the sailors and, and what they're designed to is to go directly into the wind and directly with the wind. It's called a windward leeward race course. And what that does is it causes as many tacks and jibes or maneuvers because you can't go directly into the wind, you can't go directly with the wind. It causes more maneuvers, stays within these boundaries. It makes it a tactically very hard race course for the sailors. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the best sailors in the world, make the race course hard, make it directly upwind, directly downwind. Don't make it a parade. We can all do a parade. 
even you could do a parade, Stephen. Well, well, actually, that would be pushing on. it. Let me take that back. Yeah, take um, it back. <laughs> <laughs> take it back right now. But the, but the crazy thing here is, I suppose in many ways, uh, that it's like they don't want to be doing the quarter mile <laughs> on a drag race, right? Right. We, we, we want to be doing something. And to make this, this incredible boat entertaining. It's a spectacle. Windward Leeward Racecourse has been very traditional over the last, let's call it, oh, since 19... Uh, let's see, 1992 was the last time there were reach legs, I believe, in, in, in uh, the America's Cup. It's been upwind, downwind ever since. And uh, Ian Murray's trying to keep it that way. So race postponement of the moment, at the moment, round robin three, race number two between Enios Team UK and Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli, who will have port entry once they get the restart underway. If you are tuning in wherever you are around the world, this is an enormous day. Uh, for that boat right there, uh, you've got to remember that pre-Christmas, Ineos Team UK in the World Series could not buy a win. Absolutely could not buy a win. They were, they were, there were signs of desperation, uh, deflation from all the crew that they were trying their best to try and figure out how to sail the boat. And then post-Christmas, then into the new year in the Prada Cup, suddenly uh, they got their upgrades, everything started to fall into place. And now they are the team to chase. They are 4-0, and oh, need one race win here. And we know with a ghost race, you've got to turn up to the start and cross the line because there is no American magic. You will earn the point that is an offer. If they do both those things today, this team here, after all the years of preparation and building, designing, training and racing, will go directly towards the Prada Cup final, which is due to start racing on February the 13th. They'll have a fortnight of, as Ben Ains in his own words, buying time and giving them the flexibility to do upgrades. And that is a, an enormous advantage in this America's Cup. Well, I put it to uh, their head sail designer, Gautier Sargent, uh, a few days back and said, is there a chance that you would rather actually stay in the game and do more racing practice? And uh, he looked at me like I had two heads. He said, no way, man. <laughs> he said, race days are tough because it's all about racing that day. Uh, development days are when you get faster. And they want as much time off away from racing right now, which gives us, with Nathan makes us think, you know, we, we thought that the Kiwis had a, a big uh, a problem not having racing practice. But maybe, maybe in effect, based on what Gautier said that day, Maybe they're kind of licking their chops. They have all this time for development and don't have to be bothered with this uh, little problem called sailboat racing that you might have to do. Well, they had three weeks to, to turn things around from the December World Series race into the, the round robins here. And I bet you they didn't do everything on their list. I bet you there was a bunch of things they wanted to upgrade the boat. And yes, it's going faster now, but I bet you the designers back in the shed with the shore team, I've got parts ready to come onto this boat and they need time. And a week between the round robin and the semis is not enough to do a lot of these jobs. Our understanding is they believe the boat is not fast enough. The boat is never fast enough. Never. It does, doesn't matter what boat never. you're on, it is never fast enough. Not ever. So, OK, so on, on, that, on that train of thought, uh, Luna Rossa have been upgrading since we last saw them. It will be interesting to see if we... because. Essentially, they haven't won a race, have they, in, the, in this Prada Cup round robin? They've, there's a DNF, and then, of course, there was the capsize. So if you looked at it in those terms, they want to prove that they've got a fast boat, and they think it is faster. Of, of course they do. You know, yeah, they technically got two wins on the board, but as you said, that was because American Magic did not make the time limit in one and then capsized in the other. But, you know, we haven't seen these boats out since uh, Sunday. You know, I, I know that they all went for a little training session yesterday, but they would have changed parts on these boats. And, you know, we're trying to find out, well, what have they changed and has it made the boat go faster? That'll be interesting because, th remember, they still have another uh, foil to go. So we've only seen one of their final two foils uh, come into action. And, and, and you've got to believe that the other one, has, if, as soon as they can adapt it, uh, we'd assume they think it's faster and they will get it on this boat right away. Onto the water with Shirley Robertson. What's going on? Where are we, where are we sitting at right now? We're just beside uh, Prada. Um, I think all the guys deciding what to do with their jibs. I mean, I'm really interested in how this boat performs. I mean, they were out this week without the rig up, towing around, you know, whether that was new foils or, you know, 
just uh, adjusting the system, I guess we'll see today. To me, the rig also looks a little bit different. There's more pre-bend, you know, without any load on it. It's already bent backwards. It looks flatter. Um, but more than that, I think, you know, they need to up their games in terms of, of comms and how they manage the race course, you know, who's reading the computer. Uh, and for sure, the British gave them a real masterclass last weekend in that. So, you know, I expect them to have been working on that over this last week and, and to see a, a sort of different comms package, that relationship between, between Bruni and Spiddle. Uh, and maybe even someone else, you know, maybe they just need another head in the game. So let's see, you know, really interested to see how they come out and, and react today. You know, Shirley, I think all the teams are rethinking this kind of afterguard comms plan based on clearly the success that Giles Scott and Ben Ainsley have had. I mean, but the problem is, and, and I'm speculating here, the problem is that you you make these boats and the layouts of the boats and what people are gonna do, you literally decide that a year in advance. It's not like everybody's saying, well, why doesn't Terry Hutchinson just float now? Well, I don't think it's that simple. I, I think the boat is set up for, for people to physically, as well as mentally, have to do a bunch of jobs. And you can't just break somebody out of there and say, you just go be a tactician, you just go hang out like, like Giles Scott does. This is something that the Brits decided a long time ago, and I don't think it's as easy as people think just to readapt. No, you're right, Terry, but it, I think it's not all about engineering. I mean, part of it is, is the trust on the British boat between Giles and Ben, and I suspect there's not many people who could actually be a tactician for Ben Ainsley, who he would, he would really believe. And I think also having Giles free, he's, he's able to look at the at the computer, at the data, at the race geometry. Uh, you know, and I wonder if, uh, you, you know, we listen to the comms on all the boats and we don't really hear definitive, you know, time to lay lines, time to pins. You know, all the stuff that we would normally have, uh, you know, racing a, a big boat like this. So it's not all engineering, some of it. Some of it is just working out the trust between each other. And in some of the boats, maybe encouraging, you know, other voices. I mean, I think about the American boat, you know, Paul Goodison is an extraordinary tactician, particularly when conditions are, are, are difficult and unpredictable. And, and, you know, we're not sure that he's being listened to. And, and I think on the, and the Italian boat as well, you know, we just need definitive calls from the helmsman that's to leeward. And currently, it just all seems way too polite uh, on that boat. <laughs> well, we were just looking on an overhead shot of, uh, well, it's dry on that side, but on the other side, uh, there was a lot of water in the cockpit just to let people know this is how these boats, what happens to these boats when they sit there, especially when they heel over to one side. They literally have drain holes in the side that tend to fill up the uh, cockpit. So we did cold. not have a sinking situation here on Ineos. It was just just the way these boats sit there, and maybe we'll see water slide. There it is, water sloshing around. No panic, people. We are going to have a race today, and they're going to be up and running here sometime soon. Interesting, Kenny, you talk about no panic, because in the press conference, uh, Jimmy Spittle responded to a question about, you know, what they think about the race. His focus is all on the race, but he did say, uh, a quote, there is no desperation. We don't get desperate in Luna Rossa. And he also, Nathan, made the sort of made the su suggestion that maybe, I think the quote was, maybe we got a new foil. Well, people are pretty cagey, aren't they? You know, <laughs> in this game, the America's Cup, everyone on board the boats, they know what they have. And they know the other teams probably know what they have, but they're not going to hand over information for free. And they sure as hell don't want to tell us anything, that's for sure, because we're going to blab it to the whole world. So part of the game, you know, trying to trying to hide what's up your sleeve and what are they doing there? They are pumping air into the foot of the mainsail. I think there's airbags in between uh, these twin skins on these mainsails that actually keep them separate, keep the keep the skins apart and help increase the foil. So I think a lot of them have airbags in between the two skins in different parts. Of, they might have airbags up in the top of the sail, too, at the same time. Again, this is the part that's that's unfortunately being covered by the by the black sails. But at the same time, there's lots of stuff going on in between those skins, uh, just like what's going on, on the outside of the skins. Well, that was my buddy, Luke Parkinson. We were a part of the Artemis racing team in Bermuda. And um, 
I'm going to have to give him a call after today and find out <laughs> what sure exactly they were putting air into there. But Nathan, you just said they don't tell you anything. No, but now I know he was pumping air into something. <laughs> so I want to know, is it, was it air or was it, was it, or was it hydrogen or something like that? He was reminding you what it's like when you when you get a flatty on your on your mountain bike when you're riding into work and saying, "Yep, this is what we we have to do this for something a little bit bigger." You know, Stephen, we also haven't touched on the fact it's got to be hard for the American Magic team today watching all this take place. Yes, I'm sure they, they're working around the clock, but uh, we have a lot of fans back in in the states. I know joining us on NBC and and just for everybody back home. Uh, they've created something called a kudo board, and it's it's a uh, it's a message board essentially. There's a link on the team's homepage, so if you if all those North American fans um, want to give a, a, a bit of a cheer to their team, uh, you go to the go to their web page, go to the team's web page, find out the link to this kudo board, and you can send anything you want. So uh, uh, nice job so far. Sounds like everything's Great going job. really Great well job. down this the street, the by the way. We and, uh, are setting your new start time for. 435. 435. 4.35 local time is the new start time for Run Robin 3, race number two, two between Luna Rossa, Prada Pirelli, and any else team you can. We're going to talk about Prada because uh, it was interesting listening to what Shirley was saying on the about how she feels they, they need to get their comms right, that they, they may be a little out of sync if they got to get themselves together. I mean, even Jimmy Spittle said, we notice a few things we need to sharpen up so maybe they're just not in their in their groove yet nathan oh that's what he said yeah, everyone is trying to find ways to improve and i've been involved in the past two america's cup and you spend the whole time trying to work out what the other team is up to how they operate how their boat set up how fast it is and it's not until racing begins that you finally get to understand who does what on the boats and you know, Jar Scott, you know, he's been doing a great job as a tactician. In December, we kind of thought, well, what's the point of having a tactician if you're not fast enough? Now they're fast enough, he's coming to his own. <laughs> Amazing how that all changed, didn't it? How, how the second guessing stopped immediately. <laughs> yeah, you're like, wow, <laughs> they are so smart. So now Luna Rossa are looking at it going, well, you know, we've got Francesco Bruni on one side, Jimmy Spittle on the other side. They're sharing the driving and the flying of the boat. And then they've got... Pietro Sibello trimming the mainsail. That sounds like that's the three key guys in terms of the speed loop and the, um, I guess, the, the tactical decisions. Whereas Ineos has got dedicated flight controllers in Luke Parkinson and Lee McMillan. They are flying the boat. So Ben Giles, they don't get involved in it at all. They've got Blen and Munn trimming the main, who's fully focused on speed and targets. He doesn't get involved in any of the race decisions. They've just got Giles and Ben looking at the breeze and, and Ben's got a good eye and so does Giles. It sort of goes along the path of what he said in the press conference uh, about dealing with efficiency and uh, because of only having six grinders as opposed to eight and the way they were doing things. It's all about efficiency. Uh, efficiency meaning how much power you can you produce but also to, to trim the sails. And also running the boat. Itself, and running the right? boat. You know, yeah. like we talk, you know, in Bermuda for us and all the teams there, everything was powered by the grinders. Whereas now they've got batteries powering the, the, the foils. And I've asked the guys, you know, are the boats more power demanding or are they less? And they said, well, it's just slightly different. We're now having to trim the sails and you want to trim the sails as fast and as accurately as you can. So the more power you can supply, the faster you're going to make the boat go. Just briefly, Kenny, as we look at the huge spectator, uh, spectators uh, gathering on Mungawik and North Head to take in, oh, which I think is a cool thing to do, but have a, a stadium course. How is this now affecting the setup again? Do they have to reset their thinking for a, another start? Because they would have been primed and ready to go, and suddenly the, the wind's pulled out, right? Well, well that's, that's a good question, but I think that's the easy part for sailors. You know, we were talking at the beginning of the day. Is there apprehension due to the, you know, breeze strength based on what happened last week and things like that? Yep. The real answer to it is any athlete, as soon as the, the game starts, you, you go, you know, whether whatever the sport. And... They'll go right back into their starting routines. You can see they've just left the, the tender. They'll start They'll start uh, getting into their pre-race routine, just like any other race. So 4.35 local time. 4.35 local time is the new start time pinned for this. So round robin race three, race, excuse me, round robin three, race number two between Enios and uh, Luna Rosa.
The AC75 has emerged as one of the undisputed stars of this America's Cup. The flying monohulls are harnessing the wind like never before. And they are, believe us, a real crowd pleaser. But how do the creators and designers feel about their masterpieces? It's been three years since we came up with the concept of the AC75 and it was certainly a pretty bold concept to push out a design that different from anything that had been done before and I think seeing the yachts out on the race course, match racing and really exciting manoeuvres, amazing straight line performance, it's a combination of uh, relief and real excitement. We started really with some conceptual work on paper just to get an idea how the dynamics of that boat work and then put together a model in the simulator and then the design work could start and that was definitely a big challenge. The first time I saw the drawing of an AC-75 I said nah this is not going to work. And I was wrong. It's working very well. The AC-75 is probably the most complex yacht out there in terms of system. There's a range of systems which on their own have appeared in some yachts at various scales, but putting all that together and the AC-75 is way up there. The boats are impressive pieces of equipment. They're exceptionally um, fun to sail and the technology that goes into them is truly mind-blowing. Yeah, I mean words don't really do it justice how exciting it is to race one of these boats. Uh, the AC-75 is one of the coolest boats I've ever, ever sailed. It really is. It's a real beast. You know, the power of the boat, the performance that you see, you know, the effort that it takes to sail a boat well. You've got 11 people on the boat all working flat out to keep this boat flying on a knife edge. It's a really, really cool boat. In terms of performance, we reach now, especially upwind, uh, boat speeds and VMG, so velocity made good, that are beyond everything that we have seen before. Even the, the catamarans, the AC-50s, downwind the performance is probably comparable between the AC-50s and the AC-75, but upwind uh, they don't compare. It's really a milestone. I think the first Fully foiling monohull America's Cup will for sure be a milestone in America's Cup history. Where it goes from here, um, it's very hard to say. Let's see how it goes, but um, really hope they're here to stay. Gotta love these boats, Kenny. Well, right after the Bermuda America's Cup, I just, out of chance, ran into Grant Dalton on the street, downtown Hamilton, Bermuda, and he said he wanted to do something different. Well, guess what? He nailed it. <laughs> this is as different as it could possibly get and as exciting as it could get. That is the Waitamata Harbor. We are on stadium course number C for Race number two and round robin three. You can see on the bottom or right of your screen, time to start. The readjusted start time is just over 11 minutes to go. A must win, simple must win for Luno Rossa Prada Pirelli. Ineos Team UK, well, they can actually not win today and still go to tomorrow and potentially go through. Let's just remind you what this is all about. But when it comes to point scoring and, and how you get to the, the big show, which of course is the match from March uh, number six. Uh, the process is this, uh, whoever finishes the round robin top goes to the Prada Cup final. That's what Enios want to do today. The remaining two challenges race in the first to four semi-final series. The winner of that then facing the top qualifier in the first to seven Prada Cup final. The winner then moves on to the match, the big show. So where are we right now? Okay, so this is how it stands. Let, me, let us remind you, Enios are in the box seat to advance directly to the Prada Cup final, needing two more wins, right? That's the win, hopefully they, they think now, and then the ghost race following. But as we saw last week with American Magic near sinking, anything can happen in this America's Cup. So today and tomorrow, round robins three and four, 
have been adjusted due to the retirement with withdrawal of American Magic from the stage of racing to get Patriot ready. They, and they're saying, hopefully, on the water next Wednesday, which is magical. In effect, this weekend has turned into a head-to-head -head between Ineos and Luna Rossa. If Ineos defeats Luna Rossa in our opening race, which is not too far away now, and completes the ghost race against American Magic, then they advance directly to the Prada Cup final. Luna Rossa must win both races today and tomorrow. If they do, the Italians earn direct entry into the Prada Cup final because of being the, the last boat to win a race. So everything is on the line today for these syndicates. And they're back up on their foils and looking forward to getting into that pre-start area and get this racing underway. The course has been adjusted. This is the team, Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli in their sixth campaign with the pressure on them to deliver. What have their upgrades done? What difference are we going to see today from them? I bet we see two new foils today, Nathan. That's that's going to be my guess. I think this time in the shed this past week has allowed the teams to put some bits and pieces on that they weren't expecting to get on this early. We used to see shiny trim tabs in the back of, in the back of the boat, and I, well, I might be I, I might have just I might have just failed on that one. It looked a little shiny in the back end. I thought we had seen two all black foils, but we can tell by the size of the trim tab, that's for sure. Well, Ken, you know, your your point's pretty accurate. Like, if they've been out toe-testing without a rig up, they're, they're testing something on their foils, aren't they? Look at those Actually, they're tests. both shiny today. We haven't seen that in a while, have we? So does that mean they just sanded off the, the black paint? You know, because Ineos put black paint on their foils and they went quick last weekend. Maybe they thought, well, we'll go half fast and we'll have a, a silver flat. Doesn't it make a great side when you see these AC-75 basically hooning around on the race course? That, that, that nose, the bar so flat to the water. They have gotten good at it, and it's one of the problems for us, uh, Stephen, actually, as these teams get so much better at sailing the boats, the, the mistakes are what is, is the easiest to talk about if you're in the booth here with us. And, and these guys, they're getting better and better at it all the time. They're getting smoother on their, on their skis all the time. When you look at any us team, you can go back to that first win in the Prada Cup round robin. Everybody's going, oh my goodness, what happened here? Reliability comes to mind. Nothing breaking. Reliability is super important. If you lose a race because a part of your boat fails, Three shots, three shots. This is the race committee. Goal. We are setting a new start time for 16.45. Shirley, just quickly down to you. I've been looking at the observations here. Has the wind all of a sudden flicked back to the left out there? What's going on? Yeah, good spot. It's it's dropped a bit and it's gone back to the left. And we just heard from the race committee, we have a new start time of 16.45, so another 10 minute delay. It's, you know, this race course is not easy for all the reasons we've talked about before. There's, there's lots of land, there's lots of weather. Uh, the land is high and, uh, you know, this is a thermally enhanced breeze as well. So there's there's lots going on. So feeling a little bit free in Murray at the moment. But as you've said, we have we have time for this race and he wants to really make sure it's, you know, it's good and solid and fair. Shirley, which boat, boat are you closer to at the moment? We are close to Ian Murray. <laughs> you're taking, oh, you're taking our shot. There we go. Sixty minutes. He, look, he looks very calm and ready. That, that, so that, no, that, but we're not far from either of them. <laughs> yeah, we're not, Stephen. We're not far from either of them. Both of them are, are waiting in this start box. We saw Ineos have a have a practice, a practice lap. It doesn't take very long. They've been up the top of the course and back and. And I guess as the wind drops, they'll be starting to think about, you know, about setup, about jibs. It, it's tricky, isn't it? <laughs> We've talked about this before, you know, absolutely having the right setup for the conditions and, and the margin for, for errors are, are actually quite, quite slim either way. Uh, the reason for the question, the Kenny and Nathan were just musing about foils and whether or not you, uh, there are new, uh, newish foils or the new foil on. Luna Rosso Prada Pirelli, and whether you could uh, spot it, you had spotted anything that might suggest they are running new falls, considering what they've been doing in the week leading up to this race. 
Stephen. I think they're trying to dupe us. <laughs> it's a good, uh, a good. Uh, hopefully, you'll get a close-up. We'll offer you a shot of it. I mean, I thought the same thing as uh, as Kenny did. I mean, we saw them out uh, toe testing, which, which indicates you know some sort of foil testing going on. We kind of heard that they were waiting for a foil and that probably it had arrived. Uh, la we remember last weekend they, they raced on asymmetric foils. But uh, we're a bit duped really because the back end is, is shiny and without closer inspection it's, it's quite hard it's quite hard to tell. I can't remember the orange winglets. Maybe Nathan you might, uh, you might have a better memory than, uh, th than us on that. No, we, I think we would have to check footage from last weekend, but I don't remember them having those fluoro wingtips, and I don't think that's got much to do with speed. I think that's got to do with, with vision for the, the guys flying the boat as a point of reference. But you can see those little black dots down the centre of the foil. That's got my assumption to do with the, the hinge between the flap and the main foil, and it's impressive how close our cameras can get in and zoom in on that stuff, and I bet you they're hating the fact that we're analyzing them so close right I, now. I think it's the old ones. I, I think it's the old foil. You reckon they've stepped back to the same yeah. two old foils? I think that's the old foil. That, that's um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. When in doubt, make it up when you're sitting here in this booth and uh, that's, that's my story today. Well, after racing today, maybe you can ask Bruni or yeah. Jimmy what he's had in the I'll boat. Just, I'll just go over to the compound and break down the front door and you know, ask a few tough questions. Yeah, so, so, so here's, here's, here's the sort of the, sim the simpleton looking at those, those wingtips, and we talk so much about how these uh, AC-75s are like airplanes. Well, I was always of the understanding, I was told once that the wingtips on airplanes are all about fuel efficiency. They help fuel efficiency and cutting through the wind. Uh, so I wonder if that has anything to do with it from a uh, nautical perspective underneath the water. Well, the wingtips are definitely important on these things because if you notice, the foils are often piercing the water. And so if you come out of the water at different angles, if you come out too flat, then the air pocket runs down the foil and that whole horizontal that hangs out to leeward is going to be, the lift is constantly going to be changing. Whereas if you have a tip that pierces it, it might just stop the air running down the foil. If you, you know, we, we could, I could talk for hours about foil design and I'd love to talk to all the designers of their foils about the pros and cons because they, all these guys know where their foils sit compared to others, you know, in terms of area and lift coefficients and things like that. Wow, that's why you're the foiling expert. Yeah, I've, I know I just lost everyone there except for about 10 people well, in the world. Well, as soon as you start throwing out foiling coefficients, you know, you would have kept some who just love it. I love it because it's, it's uh, so close to a lot of motor racing and speed and aerodynamics. Uh, but the technology, when you think about the, the sorts of people that are designing these machines, they're, they're, they're damn near rocket scientists. And they are so involved and embedded in it. It's amazing. Well, why do you think Ben Ainsley thanked the guys at Mercedes so much the other week? You know, they are the experts when it comes to the design of aerodynamics. You look at all the complicated fairings that go on a Formula One car, and you remind me of the last time Mercedes didn't win a championship. It would have been almost a decade ago now, right? And if he's got... He wouldn't be letting Lewis Hamilton at the wheel here, though. There's no way he'd be putting Lewis Hamilton up. No, he wouldn't be, but he'd be loving chatting to their designers. And Toto Wolff, he said, you know, they speak to someone like Toto Wolff. At the Wolf, top end. the top end, and if they're offering help and assistance, it's no, no surprise that their performance has improved, is it? Luna Rossa, Prada Pirelli, new start time for race two of round robin. Number three is now locally 4.45. That's 4.45, a quarter to five, on a Saturday afternoon, early evening. It's been another great day in Auckland where summer has been calling and delivered. It's also delivered a great spectator fleet three, as well. Yeah, three chefs, this is the race committee. We are delaying your start. New time will be set for 16.55. And just as we speak, we go to another postponement. So it's now 4.55. That's 4.55. Mother Nature is not playing ball today. We just want a boat race. You know, we've been waiting a week now and uh, nearly a week. And uh, everybody's anxious. But like Nathan said earlier, the weather is always either the the grand part or the bane of our existence with, with, uh, with, with this sport. And uh, we got to just deal with it and uh, wait and 
hopefully we get ourselves a fantastic boat race when uh, when we're ready to go. And, and you know, we, like we said before, the race director, Ian Murray, he, uh, he absolutely is doing the right thing and trying to get a fair race. So 4.55 now, 4.55, the official start time for this race. Round robin number three, race two. The America's Cup has a long history of innovation. It is as much a technological race as it is a boat race. Yep, fame and glory often goes to the sailors, but they are only as good as the race platform that supports them. So why don't we take a close look at how the race management system actually works? With these boats, you know, we need to have really high quality controls on what actually the race course is and be able to make decisions very quickly. The boats are going faster, so a lap of the course, you know, back in Newport in 1983 was probably an hour, and now it's about seven minutes. And so, luckily enough, we've got some really smart people that can write those programs that allow us to move on from conventional race management into you know, fast track, automated, high quality information that is shared with broadcast and the viewers. Mark that one, mark that one. We are happy for you to drop your mark in its current position. Over. Okay, drop now. Drop. Drop, drop. 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 So the purpose of the system is to get all the people who are out and about on the cup information that they need to be able to do their job. We've got Ian Murray sitting on the signal boat. He needs to know what the wind is. He needs to know how to set the course direction. And then he gives us the information about what the start time is and what that course will be. We've got the, the skippers on all the sailing boats. We've got the marshals out around the spectator perimeter. We've got the broadcast crew who need to know where the race is set up, again, what the course is and how it's all shaped. Um, we've got all of these different legs needing to know different pieces of information, and they have different pieces of information themselves, and that needs to all come together into this central part to then go back out to where everybody else is. We provide some technology that lets, lets the event run, really. It touches almost every part of the, of the organisation, from setting a race course to helping the, the team sail their boat and stay class rule compliant in their AC75s setting the course and keeping the spectators out of the way and also that data goes to the broadcast for creating the, the TV product that everyone around the world is watching. Wow! They got the inside overlap and they have no reason to bear off until they want to. There are four umpires who are watching the action through the race management system and so their job is to ensure that the racing is done fairly and within the rules. This is the umpires, penalty USA, but cleared. So for sure, they are one of the one of the key players in in the America's Cup for using the data and information coming off the water. Seventy-five foot foiling monoholes in racing like you have never seen before. Traditionally, match racing is umpires sitting in boats, following them, using their eyes and skills to make a determination. These boats are too fast for that and therefore what we need to do is to have the technology to have an accurate position of the boat so we can then make the right call but in also a consistent call which is then a service to the sailors. We still have the umpires on the water but the technology is here in the booth where we will watch the racing through the system and be able to make those calls. This is the, the pinnacle of sailing and sailing technology and it's not something you get by accident. It's a big group but there's a lot of key parts of, of the puzzle which come, come from New Zealand. It's made entirely new ecosystems and the boating industry that's up here in, in Auckland has stemmed a lot from the amount of technology and the work and the spectators that come in for the cup. Um, the first time I was ever up at a cup here in Auckland, none of that really existed and it's now quite large and quite vibrant. When those boats start racing it's pretty exciting and I can assure you it's very difficult to focus on the technology when there's a screen next to me that has pictures coming off the water. So we'll be monitoring things pretty carefully but at the end of the day it's all about the boats and um, we just, just love to see them out there racing. Just over 15 minutes away from a 
restart in race two of round robin three between Team Ineos UK and Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli. We have been watching a, a lovely story about the race management system as we fly you over uh, Mongol Week in North Head. You can see just at the bottom left of your screen the, the old bunkers that used to be there and I think for World War II to protect potentially any invaders coming in. I think a long, long time ago a little Japanese sub uh, came in and no one knew too much about it till later on. Anyway, you can see Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli out there and Ineos Team UK will come into your shot soon enough. Uh, the race management system, how, how has it changed the game of sailing? It has changed the sport of sailing forever. That technology has changed. It's, well, first of all, it's made it, uh, it's given an ability to be televised. I mean, frankly, when I did it and you, you start a race and you drag it all the way out to the left hand lay line and then you tack once or twice and come back in again, well, it, it, it was boring. It was boring to watch. It's not, I think the racetrack in this, in this race management system is as much of an influence of modern sailing as the boats themselves. That's how important it's been for sailing. Well, yeah, the change in racing, you know, that we've got now the boundaries that make the race course so much closer. You imagine trying to explain to the sailors on board where the boundaries are without this kind of technology and software, let alone the way they communicate with the umpires who are sitting pretty much next to us here on land. You know, Richard Slater and his team, they have an umpire app, they watch it from the dry land and they have a couple of umpire boats on the water. As Kenny said, the sport has changed forever with the the way that race managers run these races and um, eventually this is going to trickle down through all the other facets of the sport. So we are talking a positive influence on the sport, particularly at this level. Oh, a huge positive change to how sailing has been run. Which is really the only televised level at this stage that, you know, big, big time televised level. There's some other odds and end uh, regattas out there that have that have good television. But uh, yeah, it, it, at this level, we, the world wants to see it and we're here to show it. We just need Mother Nature to, uh, to, to cooperate. Well, Mother Nature on display there with Rangi Toto and that's, uh, I don't know, just a, one of the many spectator craft out on the Waitamata Harbour today that are looking forward to some racing. We cannot wait for it because it really is a glorious day. And when you get the ch chance to get out of the harbour, if you ever, when the borders finally open, if you get the chance to come to Aotearoa, New Zealand, then uh, you will delight in what you are seeing. These magnificent pictures coming from our uh, helicopters and our chase boat and all the cameras that are based on the boats as well. Not too far away now. 4.55. 4.55. The start for this next race between Ineos Team UK and Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli. When you talk about Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli, uh, the Prada Cup round robin might be a two boat race but it is far from over and the italian syndicate they just they need a win they've got a win today they want to push hard but they are, are, are acutely aware there is no room for mistakes well this weekend obviously is our first final because uh we basically need to win uh well, mainly the first race to, to, to break even, and then, uh, and then if we are good enough to win the first uh, race, we need to win another race and go straight to the final, which is, I think, key and important, mainly because you will have more time to prepare uh, the final of the Prada Cup. Uh, what you are missing all the time in the America's Cup is time, and having the chance to, to have uh, an extra week uh, where you can control uh, your time is, uh, is key at this uh, point of the campaign. If anyone thought anyone else was going to have trouble, think again, it truly is game on in the Prada Cup. As I said many times in the press conference, when everyone was giving up uh, already, Ben and his team, I said, well, you guys don't know Ben and the people involved in the team. I knew the level of the team uh, during the Christmas Cup was not the real level of the team. We all know Ben is probably one of the greatest sailors in the planet. And Jais as well is going to be the future guy, you know. And the team, the sailors, they got on board are pretty good. So we know we got pressure on because obviously they got too much points. But uh, we need to just fight until the end and make one mistake uh, less than them. Everyone here at the base is pretty confident, but we also know if we're going to lose, uh, we're going to lose, and we need to think already to the next uh, step, which is American Magic. Here. Whoa, here. Whoa, here. American Magic. If 
sure they will uh, get back probably stronger than before because when you climb up uh, from something like that you, you have even more power than before no? for sure they are, they are facing a big challenge but uh, they're gonna come out uh, from that in a certain wind range is probably the fastest boat compared to the three of us but as I said when we saw the capsize of Team New Zealand months ago uh, I said already there it's not gonna be the last one more you race more you will push the boat and everyone here it wants to stay ahead so for sure, you can argue they could do something different, but after is always easy. But when you are ahead, you want to stay ahead, so you push it pretty hard, and uh, I would be no surprise if we're going to see another thing like that. Hopefully not, but, uh, but we need to be ready, and, uh, and uh, it's part of the game. Hurry up, stay up, stay up. Obviously, the first goal of our campaign is to get to the final of the Prada Cup. And we will do our best to, to achieve that because at the end uh, we, we work for more than three years to get there. And think step by step. I, I don't think we need to think about the cup or whatever. Now, now the first real final of our campaign is uh, this Saturday race. Luna Rosa have their fans in the race village all set to go and we're just waiting on this 4.55 start for race number two and round robin number three. It's almost pushing an hour after their official start time but there have been wind shifts and that man, uh, Ian Murray, the race director, is trying to find a fair and a reasonable course for them to race so it's eight minutes and 37 seconds and counting, and it'll be Luna Rossa against the team to beat. We've heard that over and over again. 4-0 oh are Ineos Team UK, and Sabine Ainsley on Helm knows all about the triumph over adversity. And if you think about that recent World Series, in his words, really poor preparation for the Prada Cup. No wins and a constant struggle. But lessons, upgrades, it's all been learned, and the team is mindful. You can't throw caution to the wind. got water in that boat. That boat is really low in the water right now. Something has gone badly wrong with Patriot. I think the American Magic capsize was a wake up call for all of us. You know, we push this boat really hard. And obviously, you know, those are the consequences if you push it just that little bit too hard. When the breeze is up, it's a reminder to first and foremost, keep the boat in balance and under control. After that, it's changed things in terms of the points required to win the round robins and get through direct to the Prada Cup final. And it's just up the intensity in terms of the racing that we will have with Luna Rosa over this coming weekend, up the intensity, the importance of winning those races. Clearing transom two, one now. Luna Rosa have been involved in the America's Cup since 2000. So they've been in the game 20 odd years. Very, very experienced outfit. They've got great designers, great sailors, fantastic backing from Patricio Bertelli and the Prada brand. And they're really iconic, I think, when it comes to the America's Cup. That said, there are competitors, we want to beat them, and we'll be trying our, our hardest this weekend to get that route through to the final. Very nice there. Yeah, good game. For us, we just have to take each race at a time. And, you know, if we don't have a good race on Saturday, we'll have to come back on Sunday and, and try again. But really, you just, we've just got to keep the intensity going. OK, awesome hustle, guys. Well done, nice. guys. Any us, Team awesome. UK, they go 4-0 and oh in the Prada Cup Challenger Series. It's been quite a long period now that we've been down here in, in Auckland, three months, and that momentum's slowly been building. And we've had our ups and our downs. And certainly last weekend was a real up for the team, great motivator, and you can feel that momentum growing. So actually, I, I see that we are able to capitalise on that and hopefully keep that rolling through this weekend. But, you know, it's never easy in this game and we don't expect it to be easy. So we'll, we'll always fight all the way. There are manoeuvres that we've just never seen them this smooth. Uh, something has drastically changed under the water to make these manoeuvres so smooth. Well, the benefits of getting straight into the Prada Cup final it just buys you time. And we all know in this game, time's everything. So it buys you a bit of extra time to maybe make some tweaks that you perhaps wouldn't otherwise get the opportunity. If you don't make it through to that final, you're into the repechage or the semi-final, 
which starts you know four or five days later and so it really narrows down any development time you've got so that's why it's so important to try and make it through straight to the to the Pryder Cup final and give yourself a couple of weeks breathing space to make the developments and hopefully make some more gains in both speed. The Hauraki Golf on a Saturday afternoon, waiting for a race. It will be race two of round robin number three. And as you can see the clock, four minutes and 44 seconds and counting to port entry by Luna Rosso, who are up against Enios Team UK. Both of those teams need the win for different reasons. Let's just go onto the water now with Shirley Robertson. And Shirley, do you feel we are going to get a race start or another postponement with this win? Uh, if you're in Italy or, or Great Britain and you've got up in the middle of the night to watch your heroes go head to head, I can guarantee it is going to be worth the wait. The breeze has come back in. Training. This is good the race committee. Off. We are setting a new start Plus. time, 1700. Okay, well, we just, I was about to say the wind has gone further left. There's a bank of black clouds over the city. The wind has gone further left from the course. The course is currently set at 235 and it's 30 degrees to the left of that. So another five minute delay where they, while they shift the course a little bit. A tough day for Ian Murray and his team, but the breeze is up and, you know, this course is fantastic. I and mean, expect the unexpected and, you know, just stuff happens here. And, and, and frequently, and uh, I really think it's going to be it's going to be a good race. Plenty of breeze now, Steve. Shirley, my spies told me you were an incredibly competitive sailor, and I just wonder if you were in this situation, would you be getting a little frustrated, or would you just take just come back at me and say, "Well, that's sailing." No, I mean, even an amateur sailor is well used to this. You know, you 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 keep alert, you keep on it, and we've seen these boats. You know, they just they do a they do a lap and they come back and they get back into the routine and um, it does add to the drama though and it does it does really add to the tension. I'm sure I'm sure certainly you know there you know, there's a little bit of, of nerves and anticipation about what they're going to do. I mean, in a few minutes' time, hopefully they're going to go head to head for for a really important race. Thank you, Shirley. We are on board. Uh... Got seven minutes forty seconds. Yeah, so we don't have long. Grinders are seeing Cunningham demand on their displays as well. Over. So we've been listening in the background the last minute here while Shirley was chatting there, and it sounds like Ineos have an issue with it. Cunningham on the main. The it's quite an important the tool. What it does is it increases display. the power, decreases Over. the power of the sail. It pulls Over. down the luff. All sailors know when you pull the Cunningham on, it Over. flattens Over. the sail, makes the boat go fast. You ease the Cunningham out. Powers up and goes much quicker. It's at the front of the mast, or sorry, the back of the mast. You'll see a lot of action here right now. They're about to unzip that there. They're going to get inside. It's probably controlled by hydraulics, so there's either a hydraulic or electronic issue right now. Lennon Munn, who controls the mainsail, will be trying to push buttons, and he's not getting a response. So we'll just listen on board here. So is this a situation whereby Enios can play the 15-minute The world delay? probably doesn't even know about the 15-minute car. This is something that just got established over the last few days. They gave each team the ability to postpone their own start. Don't kill the messenger here, folks. They can postpone their own start 15 minutes. You only get one per round robin. Neither of these teams have played that card yet. So there is a possibility that if they can't get this fixed, and I'm sure it's hydraulic, uh, if they can't get it fixed, they will play their 15-minute card uh, in order to give all these uh, folks more time to actually get the work done to, to make it work. Maybe we could just listen in on any else for the moment and just try and pick up on the chatter. Yeah, you're gonna, it's, it's going to be all about uh, the chatter. It's going to be from the people actually doing the work, the sailors. Wait to the last minute before we play a card here. Yeah, so that's the card we were talking about, that 15-minute card. So, uh, yeah, they, 
there's a chance there could be another delay, and this time not from the weather gods or Ian Murray, but from uh, the hydraulics on board the boat. The, these sails so depend on these Cunningham operations now. The, the, load, the, the load share that, that goes up the luff of the sails, the, the helix structure that goes up the, the, the luff of the, of the sail is, is so important to the mass bend and the overall shape, power, depower situation on board the boat that it's, it, you couldn't, I don't think you could really sail the boat functionally without this working at this stage. Nathan, quick fix, long fix. Um, yeah, let's get I don't know, it's, it's hard to tell. You can see these guys here, got, that's like a hydraulic um, fluid there. It looks like maybe the down on pressure and maybe they can pump more pressure into the hydraulics to get it to work, but it could be electronics. It could be, sometimes these things, it's a simple case of going control, alt, delete, setting the computer. You know, when you, your computer's not working, you turn it off and turn it on again. It, I'm sure yeah. it's not that simple, but you know, if, if, if it was me trying to fix it, that's what I'd try. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd walk away and say, good luck, fellas. Exactly. Four minutes and 18, 17 seconds and counting to Port Entry from Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli, but we have already heard uh, Sir Ben Ainsley on the Enios boat saying we might play our car. That wind, uh, what is it telling us, Kenny? Well, they've, they, the wind has gone to the left, but you can also see that they've moved the start finish line down to the right in the box as well. So, so the, the course itself is skewed to fit within the box right now and to be a little bit better at an upwind, uh, downwind setup. But I wouldn't be surprised if they push this 15 minute uh, button on, on Ainsley's boat for a little more delay that if Ian Murray doesn't actually sort this course race out. Race committee, race committee, Team UK. Ineos Team UK, go ahead. I think we're about to hear it. Race committee, we would like to request a delay, please. Ineos Team UK, we copy that and we'll add a 15 minute delay to the start clock, making the new start time 17.15. Yes, Team UK. Yes, Team UK. Many thanks. So confirmation, we have a 15-minute delay, not by Mother Nature this time, but a, te a technical issue. And, you know what, I, I feel like coming back at you now and saying, who's under the most pressure now? It's the old Murphy's Law thing. You think one team's going to just, you know, bolt on home, and then some little thing happens. Gremlin. A gremlin. Yeah. Well, they, the good news is they were zipping up that uh, that area around the t the tack of the mainsail. So they're, now they're focusing. Now they're focusing on down below. You see, uh, I thought I thought you saw some folks down below, kind of looking around as to how the systems work. We got manhole open here at the back. We saw, I think it was Nick Hutton jumping down the front hole. So they've got people inside the hull right now trying to work out. You know, if it's not at the mast, you just keep chasing the problem until you find where the problem is. And these boats are incredibly complicated downstairs. And that's it, by the way, 15 minutes and, and they're racing. So they're still on the clock. This takes a tiny bit of pressure off, but they are still officially on the clock. This is putting the cat proverbially amongst the pigeons here, because <laughs> can you think? It, could you just imagine this? They have they have been the team to beat. They are the ones to beat. They have looked. They have looked from afar, unless you're a sailing expert, invincible to the the the, the common eye, right? Four and zero, and everybody's going, "Wow, no one's going to touch them." And just when they're on the cusp, the cusp potentially of heading straight into the Prada Cup final, as you say, Kenny, a gremlin. <laughs> a gremlin. Yeah, but you got to give credit where credit is due. They have talked through every one of these scenarios. I, I'd be really surprised if they can't fix this because th this is the best in the business at fixing boats, at fixing systems, at understanding this. They all hand built to all these systems, the people who just jumped down that hatch. So Nathan, I'd be shocked if they don't get this fixed. It'll definitely get fixed. It's a question, can you fix it in 15 minutes? You know, in all the America's Cup sailing that I was doing in San Francisco and Bermuda on the, the four-lane catamarans, we used to measure our training session in efficiency. You know, how much of our session in training we were spent 
sailing. And yes, you take breaks to discuss how to improve a bit or how, you know, to re-energise, to get food and drinks, but the percentage was always how long do we fix the boat on the water versus how long were we sailing it? And sometimes it was 50-50. Sometimes we spent more time stationary fixing problems with our boat. And you'd often get to the time when it was starting racing and you're just going, I really hope that our efficiency is good today and we don't have a breakdown on a race day because it happens all the time in training. So leader on the boat as the leader, the helmsman on the boat, and you get a situation like this and you, you know that you're close to something special, potentially getting a win, going through to, you know, let's say the preliminary big show. How are you coping with this? Is it, is it because of the practice? Of you, you, you just trust your people, you know. The, the sailor's job is to sail the boat, and you see Luke Parkinson here. He's he's getting involved trying to help the shore crew with various things, but you don't see Ben and Giles doing that. Ben and Giles are all about the racing. They're all about we need to be ready for the, the start. They'll be discussing here the tactics and strategies of when we finally do get racing. You don't let yourself get distracted. But in a way, they, they do have a... They got a little green card here too. Let's let's just take worst case scenario. They're out of the race today. They still got another day to do this. You know, if if you're if you're the Italians, you you don't have another day. You wouldn't have that little reprieve. So so I still stand by. They got 14 minutes to go. We're gonna see these guys zipping around here in a minute. But it is not life or death. They they do have another day. Let's go on board, Ineos. What do you think, Breeze? Why? You're just trying to work out where we land this Cunningham. Do you think they're trying to fix it in one position? It kind of sounds like it. Landing the Cunningham, yeah. they're going to pull it to a spot and yeah. fix it. Average is 17, Bleds. Copy that. Yeah. Can you expand on landing the Cunningham? I guess we need to be careful here. Well, normally they're adjusting the Cunningham. They pull it on and they let it off. Right now, they're just going yeah. to tie it in one position and leave yeah. it for um, the race. There's a bunch of orange bands go, right yeah. above where we Parco just, uh, is on the sail right now. And they, they, see those orange bands right in the middle of the screen. And there's a band on the mainsail and a band on the mast. They actually use that as a visual trimming aid to figure out how tight the Cunningham is. There you go. Good, good camera work. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to pull that down. They could potentially pull that to a point fix it down and then that's it for the race at least it's on safe. it's tight and it's bending yeah. the mast approximately where they want it ends up being just set and forget and then they just have to sell smart don't see they? it's already down a little bit more it's down to the middle band right now how does it limit the boat's performance uh, great greatly because that structure that that uh that structure that helix structure up the luff is a major part of sticking your foot on or off the pedal powering up downwind, depowering upwind, and who knows how it all works with these intricate systems between the twin skins of the mainsail. It's going to be a lot of load on it without the sheet tension. It's a lot of load without the main sheet tension. So what they're talking about is the sail is designed okay, to be loaded in, in all here. corners. Okay. And right now, they're right, just pulling down on that Cunningham and really, really working Maybe the fabric, the, the 3 d eye fabric, hugely hard okay. because the rest of the sail now, isn't loaded. Um, it's not, load it's is. not it kind of loaded uniformly across the sail, and you can break a sail like this okay. very easily if you're not careful. Oof. I, for one, are hoping that this sale does not break in front of world okay. television. Just, just personally, I'm just going to throw it out there because that is that is point loading to the nth degree right now without loading up the rest of the sale. So trouble for Ineos Team UK ahead of the start of race two in round robin three with 11 minutes and 12 seconds and counting to go. Their race boat, Nathan, has been compromised. Massively compromised. I, I, I don't expect them to be anywhere near as fast as what they would be capable of. They're going to be Copy. slower downwind because they're lacking right. power on, um, and slower upwind because they can't depower enough. And there might be snippets in this race where the boat is in, in range, but most of this race they're going to be out of range. 
It's a big, big uh, compromise for them. This is a big shift in this round robin series story. One oh, part. Boys. Just gonna have to try one, this one part out. on this incredibly yep. complex boat. Shirley, can you believe what you're seeing and hearing right now? Well, yeah, I can yeah, believe it. I mean, the boats are so complex. See, even this control is so important. When they first started racing these boats, the load would be about four tons, and I'm sure Kenny knows this. Now it, it's double that. It's about eight tons. And uh, from where I am, we're right beside Ineos. You can see how tight the very fabric of the front edge of that sail is. And I know Kenny's worried about it ripping, but <laughs> I can't my goodness, watch. It, looks, it looks right on the edge, Kenny. <laughs> If you look at those three stripes, it looks like what they got it about 75% on. Yep. You know, the, if it was lined up with the top stripe, that's like no Cunningham on. If it's on the bottom stripe, that's maximum. This is my assumptions, and they will have you know a digital readout with loads and percentages. But to the layman's eye, that looks like about 75% to me on. So let's just explain again for the layman who doesn't understand a heck of a lot about sailing and the effect that this problematic Cunningham will have on this boat today. Well, that is a major adjustment for these boats for, believe it or not, a Cunningham for bending the mast. A lot of people at home who sail our standard boats uh, don't use their Cunningham in that way. This is a completely new technology, a completely new way of, uh, of really adapting a sail to a sail plan and adapting a sail plan across a wind range. You're going upwind, you're going downwind, you're, you have puffs, you have lulls. That thing would be moving all over the place on a, on, on a, normal, uh, on a normal day in its normal uh, method of use. Eight minutes and 40 seconds and counting to race start. Shirley, can you update us on the wind direction, please? Stephen, the wind, it's just started to rain on the course. There's a bit more wind and it's gone further to the left. I mean, really difficult conditions for Ian Murray. Um, we'll see what happens, but plenty of breeze, a little bit squally and uh, tricky conditions for this race. You've got to love this whole America's Cup, don't you? I know we're racing the Prada Cup, it's all part of the cycle, and... You're just a rookie, man. Oh, I, I, you I, haven't seen anything yet, but I mean, last, weekend was, last weekend was rough. I mean, rough as rough can be, but uh, I'll never, never think for a minute that we're out of the woods on craziness, because that's, that's what this thing breeds. I'll take this rookie initiation <laughs> any day of the week, Kenny. Any else Team UK up and falling ahead of race start, a race that if they win. And then, here's the other thing, they've got start to complete the ghost okay. race start, right? For that extra they point. Can, they can do that without a mainsail. Take the mainsail. Don't point load that mainsail like it was before. Please. Now that it's loaded up, though, Nathan, it looks comfortable. The sail looks comfortable. The mast bend looks comfortable. It's just whether they can change gears well enough in this race uh, and not using that really critical tool. Well, they'd be load sharing now, too, with the main sheet. As soon as you pull the main sheet on, the load between the Cunningham and the main sheet starts to balance out, and they'll, you know, they'll be at less risk of jam damaging the sub. Probably the most risky point is having the main sheet off, Cunningham on tight, but they've just done a quick little half a lap of the course here to just see the, make sure everything's working okay, the rest of the boat at least, and you can see pretty puffy out there. Luna Rossa just by the tender. They'll be getting going shortly. They have port entry for this race. They'll be starboard entry for any of team. You're going away. They go getting ready for they will have heard all the communications too. They'll be knowing what's going on. They'll they'll be they'll have seen a gap in the fence. I think if they played their 15 minute card, we just call it a day, folks, head back home and we'll try again tomorrow. But that's not that as we know, that's not the case. So I'm not trying to uh, spread that rumor. Look at that puff in the background that Ineos is in. There's plenty of breeze out there. At that, um, so the line, square four. The crazy motions of these boats, you guys. It's, it's you know, just that, just that. It's like, what the heck is going on here? It's just, especially when they're stopped. That's when they're at their most... Uh, 
dangerous, really. I mean, dangerous as far as just not having any control. The faster you go, the more control you have very often. Just have to close a little bit here. Okay. Yep. Like this, okay? Yeah, you don't like this, it's fine. See that even with the mark? Get some cream if you want. Big puff. Three. So it will be Luno Rosa Prada Pirelli against Ineos Team UK. Can we get a start in race two, round robin number three? So much riding on this race for both teams. And with technical issues from Ineos Team UK, there'll be a few hearts and mouths from their support crew. And I wouldn't mind saying that uh, Subin Ainsley's start might have been a few little knots at the moment, knowing he's going to have to really manage the boat today. But one thing we know for sure here is that because Ian Murray is having such a hard time setting the race course up, it is shifty, really shifty. The breeze is back and forth all over the place. That plays into their hands. A shifty race course can make up for a little bit of boat speed. I think they're rooting for it to be as shifty as possible right now, and maybe they get away with not having a fully functioning Cunningham. Yeah, they just they just cut the the pin now, so this is the final two two six. Under four minutes to race start. Hey boys, just gonna go for a bit of speed and then I'll probably barrel on Eagle just to get down. Here in the voice of Jimmy Spittleboard, Luna Rossa, Prada Pirelli. You can see what the wind is doing on the course. No Shirley, point. any shift? Now, uh, Stephen, it's, it's looking good. Yeah, the breeze is here. in. It, it stopped raining and uh, hopefully we're ready to go. Shirley Robertson, a two time Olympian. Our eyes on the water, none better. Turning. Ineos Team UK now have to manage their boat. They win this one though, complete the ghost race and enter into the Prada Cup final. There's always a story in the America's Cup. When it rocks the Prada Pirelli to the left of your screen, down to the bottom, they will have port entry. They can enter in 2 minutes and 10 seconds. Hurry, Jack, this is the race committee who will be delaying the start. New start time, 17.20. So, there you hear it again, race committee, they've seen a, a shift in the, the wind, so it's now a 5.20 local, 5.20 local race start. Yeah, it's just a shame, it's such a shift, you can see the dark water on the top of the screen, such a shifty, puffy breeze. Nathan, sometimes you think on a day like today, yeah. you just leave it be and wait for the quickly. shift to come yeah. to you. But they're trying their hardest to be aggressive and move this race course around and, and get it sorted and straight for the start. But you know what? After the start goes, there's a reasonable chance that one of these legs turns into a bit of a parade. It's that shifty out there, and, and it can last for a long enough amount of time and you could end up reaching down the race course to one of the marks at one stage. Exactly. I've been looking at the observations on some of the um, headlands around here and Bean Rock, which is sort of in the center of our race course, we've had as far left as 270 and as far right, sorry, as far right as 270, as far left as 195. That's a huge angle change across the course and if you're in that lefty, you'd aim at the top mark, no tax, and if you're on the righty, it's sort of the same and pressure's been anywhere between 20 knots and 14 knots out there. I, I've been living in Auckland now for you know the last year or so and spent a lot of time out on the water watching these guys but out on my foiling sailboards and stuff as well and it's always shifting you know this southwest direction comes off a lot of land it's just flicking left and right of the, uh, so let's check the land and, and the weather systems here are quite up, unpredictable. Uh, well, it's one of the challenges of a stadium course, right? We're trying to we're trying to make the sport itself more accessible to everybody who wants to watch it. Believe me, for everyone out there, it is a stunning sight out on the water. But one of the challenges is you, to get stadium seating, you get close to land, and when you get close to land, you get unpredictable breeze, and that's that's the problem. 
his life on board in an AC-75. He put that woman fall down and touched the nose and it's a fair bit of spray that comes in your face. That's why everyone's wearing those goggles. All the way down. 5.20 local time is the new race start for this encounter Parallel between Luna Rosa Prada, Prada Pirelli and Almost Team the Neos here. UK. So this this is boat in the front of you, they've had their upgrades in the past week. There is speculation there might be a new foil on it. They say they are getting fast. In fact, Francesco Bruni has said this week, we are definitely making the boat go faster day by day. He would love nothing more than to have it go really fast today and pick up the win and put all the pressure back on NES Team UK to race tomorrow. Both teams want direct entry into the Prada Cup final if one of those teams finishes top of the round robin series. here in the water at the moment. I'm surprised, there aren't, I'm surprised there aren't people on Ainsley's boat right now still trying to work on that Cunningham operation, but obviously they don't think they have enough time and they want to kind of stay mentally in the game and start setting themselves up for uh, that pre-start routine in order to, to get into the starting line on time. Luna Rosso Prada Pirelli on the left, Ineos Team UK on the right. Three minutes 50 and counting towards race start. Probably one of the most important races in the history of that team there. They are flying, they are motoring on the Waitemata Harbour at the moment. They will have starboard entry. All the preparation over three years could come to a head today for Ineos if they can snare a win. This is a very tough one for the tacticians to try to decide which end of the line they want to start at. Normally they do a lot of homework before they start with their race software, you know, this end of the line's favourite, but with this wind shifting around so much, it's kind of like put the software away and get your eyes out of the boat and that's where I think the advantage might go to Giles yeah, Scott. If that boat can be fast enough, then the, the tactician being free enough there, I think, levels the playing field now. Yeah. Get that feeling back in round robin two race number two, the winner uh, uh, also got beaten by 18 seconds. That was, if you remember, the second race because that got, the first race got stuffed the spine by Winship and then any other team you came was actually taking the lead off off uh, Luna Rossi with some magnificent Tracking. work again in that race by Giles Scott. So here we go, closing in on yeah, entry water. on the port by Luna Rossi Prada so Pirelli. Yeah, no, right. Raising, raising forage. Using, using. Yeah, no, it is. Boys, trim, trim. That's good there. No lower blazing. No lower than that. That's good. Okay. Luna Rossi is in Ineos 2 UK and they are okay. clean to start yeah. fighting. Shifty, breezy. We've seen a record of 14 yeah. tacks in a race. As shifty as this yeah. is, we may I see that record I broken I today board. with teams having to tack on the smallest and subtlest of wind shifts. Italy bearing away here. This is where the boats are going to start to aim at each other on the exit of this maneuver. Yeah, it's going to be early here. Square. No, Luna Rossa do look quite early on their turn back there. He's yeah, Ainsley picks there. that up, so he's going to go behind. Very likely go behind and tack and then start that pushing maneuver. Really early, but that's a small starting box, starting area down there right now, Nathan. So it's a struggle for them both not being early. 
it's bound. You don't want to come off the foils. You come off the foils, it's a long deal. So, power in the start right now is to Ben Ainsley and the crew. Here comes the pressure. Speed. Coming on. Missing out. Going away. Mike went down. Jimmy Smith will come on Luna Rosa trying to stay on the track, yet not be too early for the line. He's locked. Oh, he's come off the fall there. Big slam down. After the official race start, we are finally underway in round robin three, race number two. Luna Rossa, Ineos Team UK, must win is at top of mind. Amazing timing sequence there, breaking these both. How hard it is to slow down and speed up at those speeds, at those radical angles. Incredibly well done, actually, by both teams going into that start. Pressure on the way. Coming up to That's boundary really protection time, Nathan. Yeah, so this will be the Ineos rolling into attack pretty soon. You see a board going down now. They had to attack because of the boundary protection for Prada. Turn around, 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 both Just speed and a little intersection right when they come, come back port here. starboard. Okay. On the wing here. Yeah, up now Getting it's about the wind shift then. out there. This is going to be a drag yeah, race across this race hand. course. And surely, yeah, who do you hill. think has the advantage as they head all the way across? Yeah, yeah. Look the north head. Yeah, Kenny, okay. we're on Kenny the right hand the side, the just under North Head, and it looks really good here. Plenty of pressure. A massive big shift. So. You know, Ben's going to get here yeah. first. We'll see if it works out. Push this way. Don't leave him much room out the other side. Yeah, yeah. he's going to be able to get it. So I think we'll go here. Stand by. Crossing. Ready. Two, one, board down. Starboard, Ineos on starboard. I think Prod is well across right now. Stand by. Three, two, one, board down. They don't like the heat tags. Not the best tack in the world from Nina Rosa, but they pull it off. Got to get the ball down earlier. Taking off a touch. Not a great tack by Luna Rosa. All of a sudden, they had the advantage, and it went badly for them very quickly here. Tiny little mistake, Nathan. Tiny mistake gives Zinios just that chance to get back into the race. And it's interesting, Ben Ainsley is to lure the whole time driving relative to the boat there. And you can see he's still on the leeward side of the boat here. Work it if you want to. Yeah, it's the no, best way to judge the boat to leeward. Not me at that moment. Up it's not easy now. to do, is it? It's not easy to steer from the leeward side on any boat, never mind two. a boat going 40 Building knots. Yeah, no, and I just had that touch down there. Hey, pro turn. Hey! This is clear, love. Yeah, that's good. Speed again. Speed again. Pressure in front. Yeah. Any time. Trimming up, trimming up, please. Yeah. 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 So they're Here just getting up okay, and falling now. That should have Luna Rossi. Yes. A few boat lengths ahead when they get to the top mark. Especially if they can lay the top marks from there, that would mean no more taps. Looking at this graphic here, it looks like both boats still have another tack and a left turn at the top mark to come. Heading towards the top gate to complete leg one of six. And it is all on. Elbows out. You must say the intensity is there in this one, isn't it? The highest intensity we've seen in any race today. Okay, My pitch. My wheel. Okay. Stop right there, guys. Stand by. Stand by. Yeah, three. Okay, possible right turn here. Go, 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 go. Your wheel, Ben? Yeah, my go wheel here. Get pressure here. Should be 
Tag. Terrible attack by Luna Ross and Prada. We have room. Uh, can't you show room here? I think yeah. we'll have room. Can they yeah. get yeah. inside? Yeah. Can Ineos yeah. get inside? They did it again. They did it again. Luna Rosa struggled on the tag. Ineos Team UK, top gate first mark. Can they get under? Luna Rosa, Prada Pirelli. Uh, this is far from over, guys. We've got a match race going on here. Simo jive both boats, jiving at the same time. Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli trying to roll them out of this jive to take the lead. I wonder why they're struggling. They've had two bad tacks at exactly the wrong time. I think they're dropping the board too late. You can hear the comms on board. You know, Jimmy's talking to Bruni about when to drop the board. Oh, he went to Windward. Seems like there's communication But still clear. He's about three to lure. Fast oh, under the board of the Shirley. You promised oh, oh, a cracking oh, oh, race. We got one. <laughs> and it's Fast not over yet, Stephen. There's, yeah. there's more to come, oh, that's okay, for sure. And, and I also think with the British boat, that they can't hold a, a tight lane, that they haven't got high. I mean, they're super fast when they're on the road, but get them to windward of Luna Rossa, and they're really struggling. We're following the boats down here, and to me, Luna Rossa just has a slight edge. They're just, they're just extending on the British all the time. You wonder, very close. Shirley, you wonder if the Cunningham is an issue when they're going downwind. That Cunningham was jammed on hard for upwind. You wonder if they can't change gears quite well enough downwind because of that Cunningham. Yeah, and I think also on the upwind, just they didn't have the modes that we're used to, we're used to seeing. My pet is building her jaws, though. Luna Rosa, Prada Pirelli, downwind leg, leg number two of six, sitting around 40 odd knots, and it's a split tack by both. They go downwind. And is that issue with the coming him on Ineos Team UK limiting their performance in this critical race? I think Lomod is good. Luna Rosa, Pat, Luna Rosa is in a big uh, right hand shift right now, it appears. But if they, if they pass back, this would be the fourth pass, Nathan, in this race so far. Stand by in three, two, one, hold down. So while it looks good with that right-hand shift for them there, when they jive out, now they're sailing the lifted tack, which is not good on the downwind. My rudder. It's, pa it's yeah. puffy it's and patchy out there, and I think, you know, when you yeah. saw how fast they were going downwind, they were doing 48 knots downwind before. I think that's got to do with the fact that Ineos can't go power the boat up downwind. So they're just in fast mode everywhere they go at the moment because they've strapped that cutting them on so tight. But I reckon they've got ahead head here. Yeah. The world will be tempted, yeah. Stephen, to say, oh, look at Giles Scott did yeah. it again. Go for our lane, go for our lane. We're going in this moment. particular Stop case. So they we're right turn here, yeah, okay. call a lane. Cross line in. Got a nice shift out Cross line in. Stand by. Five. Further. Three. Two. One. Two. One. Two. One. My pitch. Ineos Team UK, get around up, gate number three, two. two. Completing the downward leg for the first time, and they get ahead again. This is tight, though. Yeah, There's yeah, nothing in this. Just pitch. Pitch. Yeah. look on Very the good. gap, and it won't be too much. It'll be a smidge. Nine seconds. Have problems, no worries for Ineos Team UK. Prada rolling straight into attack here. They were saying right hand shift, so you want to get onto starboard tack when the breeze is right. That's going to get you up the course. So both boats now on the lifted tack. They're trying to do less distance. Super shifty out there. So um, if this breeze keeps trending to the right, Luna Russell here on the right hand side of the course, they're going to make the game. It flicks left at all, Ineos should make the tack and cross easily. So big cross coming up here, Shirley. Again, pressure on three, two, one, there it is. Still sort of long I think he's going to shake his diver attack. Luna Rosa. I've lost count of the amount of passes. <laughs> we, we, yeah. Hey, we can count them after us. Let's focus on this, I assure you. When you're racing, you don't count the passes. It's all about who's winning at the finish line. Right, you hit Ben. Yeah, copy. 
Giles talking about more right hand I pressure think. coming, so they're going to judge how far okay, they go out going to the to. right to get a better slice of it. A little Thank soft bag right hand, unfortunately, but Coffee will just try and dig into it. Hope it hangs in for us. Off the That's the geometry of the race course that they're referencing right now. Yeah, they, they would be, uh, you yeah, have a different yeah. tactical uh, strategy if you didn't the have point. these boundaries. These boundaries okay, really change this, things. Boundary Looks like Lena Ross has just tucked on the port and they've got a left hand shift, so chance they're going to leg out on this upwind and, and make a big game, but One, four down. so shifty out there. It's going to change a few more times. Over. Three laps around this race course, okay. Stephen. Five. Three laps equals six legs, we're heading towards the halfway point and Nathan suggested that Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli might make their gains and you might be right on the money there, Nathan. So the big question now is do they keep sailing the wind or do they tack now and, and tack on their face and try and get in phase with them and control the race and just as I say that they roll into a tack. So, uh, <laughs> this no. is what they didn't do last Sunday. They didn't attack him to face, and today yeah. they're uh, nice. doing a bit more match racing. Sorry, it, it is a fine line, though. Look at that wind shift. It just looks like a left shift coming right there. And it's a fine line of covering, but you have to cover smartly. You have to cover with wind shifts on your mind. Because if you just cover for the sake of covering, very often you can get passed on a day like today. Stand by. Crossing. My pitch. Yep. Ready. Two, one, four, down. Thank you now. Yeah, that's all for lifting. Yeah, I agree. Pressure in five. They'll let him go this time, Nathan. They're, they're playing the shift. I think this is the right play. Coming up, Coming up. 45, very last line Plenty of pressure yeah. coming down above him there. And come up, come up. It's a balance between left, angle and pressure. Okay. And okay. Box has got us just made it. Come up. Coming up. We just pushed all the way to boundary. Yeah, we go. Yeah, as long as there's pressure. Yeah, cool. He's just got a massive righty. So he, Ben, saying that Luna Russell got a massive righty, so they've got a big lift. It's not really ideal. You want a left hand shift when you're on the left of the course, but they might make it to the ley line. If they get massive to right that ley line and get a left shift any time, okay, they're going to lay the top mark. Shirley, on the water, how do you see this playing out at the top of the course? Five, one, four, Nathan, down. we're about 100 metres from any so we're just tacking on that right-hand side of the course. There's a big one, flat climb, there's plenty of breeze. Okay. It looks right-hand, so <laughs> they could well have, have made a really good decision, just whether it, it works out in time. There's also wind at the left-hand side of the top of this course that Prada are about to sail into. Nice. Pressure, yeah. Yeah, just, uh, okay, you got to watch, watch him on the barrel way, okay? Copy that, copy that. Copy. Two copy. Four. Yeah. Three, good course here. Little count yeah. on the mark. Yeah, stand by. Three, two, one. Clear. Halfway through yes, boys. race That's two, fun. round robin three, and it will be Luna Rosa, Brad Pirelli reversing a nine second yes. deficit at the bottom gate and turning that into an advantage over Enios Team UK. They're in the box seat at the moment. Nineteen seconds, so they've turned a nine second deficit around to a nineteen second advantage. That looked pretty windy at the top mark to me. You saw Lena Rossi get a massive heel in that fairway, and Francesco Bruni saying, ease, ease, ease. He didn't want that runner to pop out at that moment. And Ineos Team UK rolled straight into a jibe, so both boats on the right-hand shift with plenty of pressure going down this way. And that jibe by Ineos was absolutely the telltale sign that they didn't want to spend a single second on starboard tack. It was a big right-hand shift on the race course. They had to stay in phase. This is not the time to split. This is the time to play the wind shifts correctly. Downwind lead, number four, six. Luna Rosa, Prada Pirelli with okay, the lead. My rudder, up coming Sitting on. around 250 metres. Okay, my Trav. On yeah, yeah, Enos UK. Yep, my Trav. 
Okay, they're bringing down it. Very good pressure. I think uh, I think we, we extend the leader. Yeah. Come back. Bit of speed here, guys. You know, I think that's main trimmer uh, Pietro Sabello actually spending more time looking around. There's no question that all the teams are thinking about more visual help on the race course looking at wind shifts. Yeah, I think he's he comes adding back. a lot to the conversation today. And so far, yeah. there's a pressure here now. Still so, um, good games for us. Definitely paying off at the we moment. Have a nice big big, a big speed advantage with uh, any well, at the moment, sitting at yeah. 44 knots Coming as opposed to one. just under 40 yeah, knots. And they, they are flying. Look at them. You can just put the naked eye. They are, they are scooting along. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's all about the wind shift. Now, where is this next shift? If it stays in the right crowd of games, if it comes back a little left, then Ineos games. Down. Okay, little lighter on it. Okay, 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 you make a mistake, you lose. You don't make a mistake, you win. That's all we can ask for is fans of the sport. So they jump before the lay line of the bottom mark by the looks of that, which means they trying to both boats do a left left turn at the bottom here. I see what's going on. Maybe they have got him. But it's just so risky. If you let the boat behind split, there's a good chance that Ineos could get back into this. So see how this plays out. Pull a job. Pull a job. Yeah, they're going to jump in, oh, in oh, here oh, on Prado. They're trying to stay in phase. Smart move, that. Pull forward. Very good. Okay, stand by three. Three, easy, easy. Two, one, coming up. Big three, big three, boys. Prado for really around. Pull forward, pull forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gate yeah, yeah. mark number board. four. The advantage at the top was 19 seconds, but you know any other team you play have picked up nine seconds. It's now down to ten seconds. He just pulled off a phenomenal maneuver, a brutally hard maneuver, and got themselves out of phase right away. So in that case, Luna Ross has spent a bit of their lead, gave up a few seconds or 100 metres or so to get in phase, but Ben instantly got out of phase regardless. So. He's going to get aggressive up this wind and just it's a balance between wind shifts, wind strength, and uh, getting out of phase with that other boat. They're gapping forward at the moment, aren't they? Great maneuver, though, at the bottom mark, wasn't it? Perfect. Beautiful. This is a team that a few weeks ago couldn't tack or I mean, it's, it's really, really phenomenal. Boat speed's pretty similar, Stephen. Both around 35 knots up wind. Looking at the positioning of the boats on this race course, the penultimate leg, five of six, and really there's nothing in there's nothing, there's nothing in this. There's nothing in it. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. A lot of chat coming off the boats, isn't there? You can tell the intensity by how much chat there is. We got a boundary. That rear maneuver absolutely went for Ainsley to get him right back in the game. Nice. Shirley, I think it's time to go down to you. Do you. What do you see with the wind? Is Ben Ainsley okay. heading the right way right now? Is he going to yeah. retake the lead here? I think we're in phase at the moment. Copy that. Yeah. Good oh, Nathan, here. you can hear from the comms on Just board. It's really difficult to top, tell. Man. You know, normally yeah. as a sailor, Little you can tell it. if the breeze coming, if it's going to be left to right. But it's really drop. difficult. There's a lot of cloud action. Yeah. There's just a lot going on and it, it's, it's pretty hard. Uh, I, I think just looking at the pace we're right underneath Ineos now, Ineos are fast to me but they look slightly lower, um, not quite as high as, as Prada, but really difficult, really difficult day. So I'm really surprised, Nathan, that Luna Rosa did not tack on top of Ineos. I think, I think they're a little gun-shy 
from those two bad tacks on the first leg, and they didn't tack in close quarters right on top of Ineos because they could have forced them right back into a short-sided racetrack. Yeah, exactly. If you tack directly in front of them, you're you're in good shape. But right now, I can hear right-hand shift. Our numbers are right. Jimmy thinks that they're not going to cross. So Ineos are going to roll into attack here, and I think Ineos are going to go behind them. No duck, no duck. Really that last attack, they're going to really get those guys. We're going to shot Mike. Not tacking right in front of Ineos. It gives Ineos the lead again. Come on, come on, come on. 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 Come on,
cut. Let's put it in the hands of the jury. I think, I think he, that was a bit of a Hollywood. No penalty on board. No penalty. And that hands the race to Ineos there. Ineos Team UK heading towards the finish line in the race two of round robber number three and cross the line. All right, guys, calm down. And that is an enormous win because all they have to do now is complete a ghost race start and they go through to the Prada Cup final. What a race. <laughs> the Hollywood done by Jimmy Spithill to try to convince the judges that it was a port starboard. They did not, the umpires did not fall for it. And I think they made the right call and Ineos goes on to win the race. Luna Rossa, Prada Pirelli, crossed the line 33 seconds behind after at one stage leading by 19 seconds. They didn't really have any other options there. If they didn't get a piece of them on starboard, they were going to lose the race. So you may as well try and put in the umpire's hand at that point. But what a race. What a what race we just saw. Nice, mate. Well done. This is it, this last cross is gonna be it, Nathan, wasn't it? Port starboard, Prada on starboard. They start bearing off and bearing off and bearing off. They're trying to convince the umpires this is a port starboard. Oh, there's the Hollywood, oh, that's the big zig. And, and you know what, Richard Slater and company, they did not fall for it. Uh, they determined that Ineos just got across clean and that pretty much determined the race. Confirmation of this result, round robin three, race number two. Enios Team UK with the win by 33 seconds against Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli. Here we go in the race review, and after a long, long, long-awaited start, we uh, we finally got this race off, and both of these boats did an unbelievable job of, of slowing down and accelerating uh, to get off the starting line almost dead even, heading for that first uh, the first boundary and the first altercation of what was many, many altercations. Luna Rosa did a very nice job getting up in front, getting Ainsley slow, so when he tacked that first time, he actually landed down in the water and they got off their foil. So very well done tactically by Jimmy Spithill and sailed into nice pressure off to that side, but that was just the beginning, folks. We had a lot more action to go coming into gate one. Prada had two bad tacks on this leg. Another bad tack. Remember, if you can get into that circle, which they do right there on Ineos, if you can get into that circle on the inside, you have room to go around the mark. Another pass. And here we go. The yo-yo has started, and, and it just begins. This leg turned into an amazing drag race between two boats, of which Prada passed again. And at this point, you think, you know, Luna Rossa have got a decent lead, 140 meter lead. You think, oh, we probably got that in the bag. But, you know, it was this moment here where Ineos decided to tack. They went out to the right hand side and they closed it down. This was the big puff at the top mark. Boat gets quite a bit of heel. That rudder's right, just hanging on to the water. Not as much as what we saw last week, but these boats are on the edge. And, uh, you know, in leg five, this is where the lead changed. This is the moment where if. Luna Ross attack now and hold on to that lead. It's obviously very close. They probably thought if we tacked, we weren't going to keep control of the race, but that's where they left the opportunity for Ineos to get out to that right-hand side and get that right-hand shift. And this is the finish, coming to the finish. The, the incident has already passed and poured down and the boys are pretty happy. Boys are very happy and, and then very immediately scolded by the school teacher, Mr. Ainsley. Calm down, boys. Calm, Calm down, down, boys. You know, we, are, we are far from over. Learn how to win, fellas. Don't forget, those guys have been grinding flat at the horse. They've got a bit of emotion about them. So Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli get beaten, and it's a 5 0 record now for Enios Team UK.
Enios Team UK are 5-0 and and one step closer towards direct entry in the Prada Cup final. On the helm is... Let's go down to Sabine Ainsley. Congratulations, Ben. Stunning race, considering the, the issues you had pre-start. Yeah, that was one for the fans, huh? That was a pretty awesome race. It was great to take part in. Uh, lots of lead changes, neck and neck all the way to the line. You know, full credit to the Lunar Racer guys for, for pushing hard. We had a few issues going into the pre... Well, you know, all the time we're out here leading into the pre-start, unfortunately. So we were a bit on the back foot and we were missing one of the key settings for the, for the power of the boat. So the guys just did an awesome job getting us around the track in one piece and, and getting the win. So not just one for the fans, Ben, there were nine lead changes in that. Not to, not to make your heart a flutter that much more. Nine lead changes. I've never seen anything like that before. Hey, can you tell us about the, the Cunningham operation? You guys ended up just pulling it to a setting and, and essentially cleating it off. Can you just explain to the folks how much yeah. that may uh, hinder the overall speed of the boat? Well, it's just like sailing any other boat, like a dinghy, you know, like if you're in your laser and you wang the Cunningham on, you're kind of all right upwind, but if the breeze goes down at all or if you start heading downwind, you, you're compromised. So, Bledin, our, our mainsail trimmer, did an awesome job to try and keep us powered up downwind. We were losing a little bit, as you probably saw, had a high, high fast mode, but we kind of guessed the setting just about right for the upwinds and, and managed to have enough pace to, to get around. Yeah, Ben looked very impressive. Looked like you guys were low and fast upwind and high and fast downwind. But if you're on the shifts, it, it pans out very well for you. Talk us through that final cross. How confident were you that you were going to make that cross and win that race? Uh, it looked good initially out of the jibe and it looked good all the way across. And, and then we both went for a soak mode. But I guess their soak mode was a little bit better than ours with uh, the Cunningham off. So it was... It was about as close as you want to as you want to get it. It was it was pretty close, but I did think we were just across. Ben, thanks for your time. You've got a, a start to uh, take part in and to confirm that you will head through to the Prada Cup final. So best of luck with that, and we'll talk to you a little bit later. Thanks, guys. Happy fans in the village that Team Ineos UNK have uh, gone through to this one race closer to the Prada Cup final. On to Luna. Rosa Prada Pirelli. Jimmy, thanks for giving us your time. Gee, that was close. Yeah, what a race, though. Yeah, it ended up being a uh, pretty exciting race, I'm sure, for everyone watching. Jimmy, how close was that last port starboard? Did you think you had a piece of them, or was that a little bit of a Hollywood in there, or how, how did that how did that go? Did you think you had a chance at it? Yeah, I mean, for us, we definitely had a piece. Uh, we're doing, you know, 45 knots, both of us. Um, we had to avoid him, so pretty surprised to see that they thought that was um, not close enough. Yeah, I guess, Jimmy, you can have a chat to the umpires after that and, and, and get their interpretation. Hey, um... You know, it was, it was a really fun race for us to watch. I'm sure you guys loved it. I'm, not, I'm sure you didn't enjoy the result. But talk us a little bit about what was going on in that first speed. It looked like a couple of missed opportunities with some of your tacks. Was there a system issue or was that just tight racing? Uh, at the top, yeah, we uh, didn't probably pull off a couple of tacks like we should have. Um, but it was really, really shifty and really up and down the entire racetrack. And obviously that's why we saw so many lead changes. But, uh, you know, it was a good effort from the guys on board and obviously well done to those guys. Um, you know, fun race, obviously not the result we wanted, but, uh, yeah, we, we certainly learned a lot from that one. Jimmy, thanks for your time, mate. There's still a bit of work to do. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. So let's break it down. Team Enios Team UK with a 33-second win. They go 5-0. Upwind speed went, as we, as Nathan was talking about with Ben, upwind and downwind speed go with uh, Ineos UK. They had that mode be probably because of that Cunningham issue on the mainsail before the race started. Look at that, maximum speed, fifth, over 50 knots, 
for the British boat. <laughs> you don't see that very often. But they went they went a longer distance. They did. They had that low mode Nathan upwind and that high mode downwind, but they had to and they had to go really fast to try to make it work. Yeah, well that's that that VMG number, speed versus your angle. Yes, they did a bit more distance, but they were absolutely ripping. Let's take a look how efficient these boats were in this uh, race two round robin number three. Yeah, we're getting it. Look at these high speeds. We touch, it looks like we touch 50 a couple times, right? <laughs> yeah, well, let's check this. They see this low bottom speed here, that big dip right now, that down at 15. That was the tack they fell off the foils. That was when Jimmy Spittle luffed them. They dropped off the foils, and that's what had Luna Rossa leading into that top gate. But then again, you see a couple of bad tacks. You know, these guys are getting down to 30 knots in their jibes. Upwind again. Not much in it if you look at their, their speed and their tacking, but um, it's just that one error at the start of the race. When you go around those marks, how fast the boats are going, ripping around that weather mark. It's, uh, but th then for the rest of the race, it was pretty much uh, straight sailing. A lot of good tacks, good jibes, no obvious errors. That very one at the end was essentially after Luna Rosa missed, after it was declared that the protest was not upheld on that last run, that port starboard, they kind of fell off their foils and, and packed it in. They knew the game was over at that stage. All right, let's take a look at the key moment of this race. On the wind. On the wind. So this was the, uh, the nice. tight port starboard where Luna Rossa had have been able to tack in front of Ineos there. They would have essentially sort of shut down the race, forced Ineos back to that boundary and stayed in phase. Instead, they allowed a bit of a shift, a little bit of leverage to Ineos, and that's what led Ineos back into the race, and they led around the top mark. And it's such a fine line, isn't it, between being just far enough ahead to pull that tack off or not? They obviously thought they weren't, but if they could have pulled that tack off right there, it would have been a huge gainer in the race because that's they're tacking at the boundary right there. They force their competitor right into a boundary, having to make a couple really tough tacks. Jubilation on board Enios Team UK because they have put themselves one race win away from a direct entry into the Prada Cup final. Let's go onto the water. Shirley Robertson, you promised a, an exciting race. Got it. What did you make of it? Oh, Stephen, I've just got my breath. Never, <laughs> never mind them. I mean, we could not ask for more. I mean, that's what we've been talking about. You know, fast boats, close boats. I mean, great racing. And, you know, Grant Dalton had a vision, didn't Boats on this racetrack. Uh, and today we had to wait, but it really delivered. I mean, what a spectacle, fantastic. Yes, fantastic. You can bring out superlatives today. I mean, you mentioned Grant Dalton. He said uh, prior to the new year, do not write off any of Team UK. Prophetic words from the head of Emirates Team New Zealand. This team you're seeing right now preparing for their ghost start 5-0. and Let's just remind you of the standings as it stacks up right now. Enios Team UK, 5-0. and Perfect record. Five points. They'll start their ghost race and be gifted the point for completing the start with the absence of American magic. And they are untouchable after that. Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli with the two points and American Magic, as we know, have withdrawn from this round robin series. But the encouraging news is they they are, we are hearing they will be back on the water by Wednesday. Well, sets it up. Uh, any else team you can have said this before. I, 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 you're beginning to wonder they are the team to beat. Full stop. Well, there's no question. In the Prada Cup. Yeah, in the Prada Cup, there's no question right now. And, and that turnaround is phenomenal. But I think the turnaround for the sport of sailing is, is really a big story for me, Nathan. I've never, I've been doing this for a while now. I've never seen nine passes in a race. That is real boat racing. This is only good things for the sport of sailing and the excitement of the, of the whole package. 
It was impressive to watch. That, don't get me <laughs> get me wrong. That was racing at its, at its best. You know, match racing, tight, close racing, good manoeuvres, good on boards coming off the boats, plenty of chat and um, plenty of emotion at the finishing line there too. You could see Jimmy Spittle was really upset about the umpire call and the fact that they're going to be racing against they're going to be racing against American Magic next weekend. It's as simple as that. Now, just a reminder, there are still uh, two ghost race starts to be played out for points that are on offer. Uh, if you are wherever you are around the world, we certainly hope that you can stay with us. But if you can't, we do appreciate that there is plenty of racing still to come in this Prada Cup and, of course, the match, which starts at March number six. So if you're leaving us now, goodbye from Auckland, New Zealand, home to the 36th America's Cup. Waitamata Harbour and the Hauraki Golf as spectator craft head back in as Enios Team UK and Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli still have to get themselves sorted for what has been deemed ghost races with the absence of American magic because of the event of last Sunday here on the Hauraki Golf. The rules state that a race at least must be started for points to be awarded. And so Enios and both okay, Vinrosa will have to complete a race okay, start uh, and away they go again entry. and pick Copy. up the point. And Copy. that will be true confirmation that Enios will go directly to the Prada Cup the final the and Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli will have to fight out the semi-finals against American Magic. I have to ask this question of you, Kenny and Nathan. Did you see uh, improvement in speed and performance of Luna Rossa, knowing that they had made upgrades? I, I think so, but it's really hard to judge because essentially they were sailing against a bit of a wounded, uh, a wounded boat out there, right, Nathan? I mean, there's no question that everybody's saying that's just the Cunningham on the mainsail. That is a throttle on these boats. It is absolutely putting your foot on and off the accelerator or the ability to change gears. And uh, so, yeah, they look good. They look pretty good, but, you know, big but. But Ineos weren't sailing at 100%. You know, we, we, we know that if you can't control the Cunningham like we've been talking about, you, you, you're not able to mode your boat properly, so you're not sailing tactically as well either. How scary is that then, uh, that the reliability of that boat in front of us that we are seeing had a problem, went on, and by 33 seconds defeated an opponent? But it would have been different if it wasn't so shifty, I'm convinced. This is, this is pure speculation. But wind shifts are a wounded boat's best friend because you have the ability to make up for inherent maybe speed deficits that you might have. The point I'm trying to make is it didn't behave like a wounded boat from a pure pundit looking at that screen. Oh, fair point. No, that, that, that is a fair point. And I think I think the best thing right now about the racing we're watching is that we're, we're in the harbour. Yes, Ian Murray struggled with setting a course, but it made for great racing. You bring the boats close to shore, and the racing is very interesting. Ten seconds to entry for Enios Team UK in this ghost race, ghost start against American Magic. Okay. Should we on now? And for everybody at home trying to understand what the heck we're watching right now, this is just, this is a formality. This is, uh, Ineos needs to technically start the race in order to gain that point from the boat that's not out there, American Magic, which is in the shed getting fixed up to, to come back out next week. Uh, they need to just really get through this formality, start the race. They're awarded the point by the umpires, and uh, the race is over. And any practice is good practice, and when you're on a high after winning that last race, why not do it again and just keep honing those skills? Yeah, I wonder. Will they learn something through this? What do you think? Oh, they're going to learn a lot. If, if they, you know, you've got two options. Either you just enter and stop and then just trundle across the line, or you keep working on your pre-stop manoeuvres and how low and slow you can sail the boat. They're soaking right down at the bottom of the boundary. They're going to turn up, sail along the boundary. They're just working on their time on distance practice. Now. It's like a training session for them. And, you know, if I was on the water now, we'd yeah. be okay, trying to hit this line at yeah. top speed within one then. metre. Under 60 seconds to the go start. Ineos, Team UK, 
two, one, four down. Against American magic. I think they should have invited us out there, Early Nathan, the to go for a Copy. spin during this, you know, just to get good, a good onboard on. seal for us. Uh, As a passenger, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 okay, good. I'm just watching checking. how big these boys are grinding. I, I, I'm not so sure. Uh, yeah. All Britannia needs to do is cross yeah, the line, we'll come back the car, and in the again. absence of American Point magic, will be Point awarded Point the yeah, point right that was on offer for this here. race. Yeah. Maybe have to, we may have to kill another couple here. It would have go. been yeah. round yeah. robin three, race number one. Yeah. If Patriot had been out on the water. Uh, I think we're good. Go. Copy. Go. Full speed. Main on. Full speed. High pitch. Yep. Good pressure here. All the way. Main on. I nice. think their software is pretty good. Telling them how fast ahead. it is back this time. This is the umpires. USA have retired. Race of order to GBR. And it's as simple as that. Okay. And I've got to okay. say, Nathan, as you were on the money, nice. software or not, nice you picked the way they want to do it as a practice race start and timing on the button. Honestly, they're just verifying their pre-start software. You know, we these boats have computers on board that helps them start the boat. Every time you do a practice start, it's a chance to recalibrate your instruments and make sure that your polis for acceleration is spot on. So. That was just a free practice for them, and the guys in the shed will be analysing that start back, and they'll debrief that one, don't you worry about that. It's pretty spot on, though. <laughs> you can take that one, you can have that one, because that was impressive, and, and that word impressive is starting to become a, a constant with Enios Team UK, knowing what they have come from and, and where they are now, and, and how, how much better can they get. Well, maybe we should just recalibrate and say this is the expectation of that team now. And the big question is in two weeks, or what is it, a bit over two weeks, to their next round of racing? You tell me exactly how many days it is, but... February 13, that's what I'll tell you. OK, I, I, I'm not very good at mathematics, but I know, it's, I know it's a lot further away than next weekend. So that boat's going to go back in the shed, and they're going to improve it. And they're going to come back faster than what they are today. And that's the big fear, Stephen, of the other two boats right now, of the other two contenders, is they're given this team that happens to be on a roll, Another little jump, a little boost. OK, let's take it a step further. What do you think the defender makes of this this boat that seems to be getting better and better? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think they're probably interested in the fact that all three boats are pretty similar in speed right now. All three kind of have their condition. I would say right now, Luna Rosa maybe, Nathan, if we're going to if we're going to leverage this, Luna Rosa might have a little better in the light. That, uh, that the Brits might be a little better all-purpose and that maybe the Americans have a little bit, a bit better uh, when they get back on the race course in the breeze. Is that fair to say? I think that's pretty fair to say. Yeah. Yep. All-purpose, though, with these boats might be the key. It might be. And, and by the way, the Kiwis are probably setting up that way, right? Well, check out the weather we see here in Auckland. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's windy one day, it's medium, it's left, it's right. You want to be an all-purpose boat if you oh, yeah. want to make it through. All right, boys, But you want to be fast. Slow boat never won the America's Cup. I'm going to be fast all the time. So, two minutes and 23 seconds to Luna Rosa, Prada Pirelli, and their ghost race start. This will be round robin race three. Okay, boys. And Here we go. There we go, round robin three, race three. You can hear the voice of Jimmy Spittle, one of the Up twin helmets, along with Francesco one. Bruni. And then it looks like uh, Jimmy's just easing his way into the pre start area. Wow. That's taken it. That's taken his time. There's no rush. <laughs> but I bet you they still do the same thing. They try and hit uh, the start at full speed. Probably board. got a little bit less motivation on this board today than what Ben has, that's for sure. When you go back to the onboard comms we were hearing from both teams in the last race, or excuse me, the last race before the last race start, it was it was it was frantic. It was the Maybe first time really good frantic and, and competitive uh, chat. Quiet boat, isn't it? Wave on. One minute and 16 seconds and counting to race start and confirmation of an extra point. But as far as Luna Rossa, Prada, Pirelli are concerned, it's it's a nothing point. I'm not taking anything away from it, but they uh, will confirm themselves as a semi-finalist. And those semi-finalists will start Friday, January 29. 
that will be against American Magic. And th for those fans still dialed into this around the world, we're trying real hard to get back on with Ben Ainsley. We kind of we kind of dropped the ball by not asking one very key question, and that is, are you going to race tomorrow? Technically, they've won the series, right? So if we're trying really hard. We'll see if Ben comes back to us. And uh, Stephen, I think we're going to give you the ball in this one, and and you get to ask the big question that everybody's wondering: Are you going to sail tomorrow? Are you going to race tomorrow? I might. You, you, this is all you, big fella. But I may have dropped the ball. <laughs> we all did. We should. That should have been the only question that we asked <laughs> today. Thirteen seconds to start for Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli, easing themselves across the start line. Pat Robin three, race three. One, and here we go, turning. Well, you're right about one thing, Nathan Adderich. <laughs> this is the umpires. USA has retired. Race awarded to Italy. Confirmation from Chief Umpire Richard oh, Slater that the point and race have been awarded to Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli. Up. Nathan called it the enthusiasm from a, from a boat. No, from, but the enthusiasm from a boat that loses the race just prior is very different from the boat that uh, that, won, that won the race prior. Those guys did not want to be out there right no. now. No. They want to get that boat home as quick as they can, debrief that race, and probably have a chat to Richard Slater from what I could pick yeah, up exactly. from Jimmy Spittle. He wants, he wants to know what happened there. All right, so the two ghost races have been complete. Let's confirm where we stand now with the Prada Cup round at Robin. Enios Team UK with six points. Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli with three and understandably American Magic with nothing. Tomorrow's racing will look like this. So this is how the America's Cup is won. You've got your challenges, then you've got your Prada Cup semi-final. And that, of course, will be between Luna Rossa, Prada Pirelli and American Magic. The first of four go through to the Prada Cup final, of which the direct entry has been confirmed as Enios Team UK, the winner of that first to seven Prada Cup final, will take on the defender, Emirates Team New Zealand, in the 36th America's Cup. Down to Enios Team UK and Sir Ben Ainsley. Yeah. Hello, Ben. Uh, thanks for giving us your time yet again. First up, I really want to know your thoughts about going directly through to the Prada Cup final. Yeah, we're happy about that. That was the goal, and uh, we made it. So, boys have done a brilliant job. Uh, we just got Jim Ratcliffe, who's just joined us, and uh, Freddie Cars got a champagne out, but. M must be a nice, nice feeling knowing all this hard work has come to fruition at this point. Oh, look, it's a great moment for the team because we've obviously had a tough start, a tough build-up to this competition. So I'm incredibly proud of everyone. That said, we know we've still got a, a long way to go in this road. So whilst we've got ourselves in the Prada Cup final, it's just one step along the road. And now we've got to focus on trying to win that. And then after that, the cup. So uh, one step at a time. But yeah, the team have done a fantastic job. Hey, Ben, great to see the boss on board with you. We do, the whole world does, I, I'm getting texts from all over the place. Ask Ainsley if they're racing tomorrow. Are you guys planning on coming out tomorrow now that you've mathematically won the regatta? That's a good question. The forecast is quite high. If there's a race on in decent conditions and it's not, we're not going to risk the boat or anything like that, then we'll race. But uh, I think, unless you know any better on the forecast, Ken, I think it's quite fresh tomorrow, 20, 20 knots plus, so it might be just too much. Nice, Ben. Well, we, we personally hope that you guys come out and do another race. The question that's sitting on my mind is, how much have you guys got left in the tank and what kind of upgrades can we expect? Because that three weeks, you guys made a huge gain. Are we expecting the same amount of gain before the Prada Cup final? Uh, well, that'd be nice. I think if we could get that amount of gain again, then we'd be uh, serious contenders to the Cup. Um, I mean, we obviously want to want to get everything we can out of the boat. I'd say certainly there's more to come. I'm not sure quite the step that we made from the Christmas race through to the 
prettiest pride of cup but yeah i mean it's as you know nath it's so important to keep those upgrades coming and keep the performance coming ben congratulations you're through to the prada cup final direct entry been a great effort but there's a whole lot more to come and we can't wait thanks guys cheers okay, there's the boss and the, sh the mum champagne moment so jim ratcliffe mr enios himself on board enios team uk how good that feeling must be but it's not the prize that they are chasing it's a start but it's not the prize that matters it's just one step in the right direction isn't it they avoid one elimination round they get the the buy they get to go into the next round but even still you heard ben there say he he wants that boat to go quicker and he knows that there's plenty of work to be done and you can see he's starting to focus on that red boat and less so on the challenges to a degree. If he thinks he can make his boat go another 10% faster, which is what he said he did. You know, the team made the boat go 10% quicker since the racing in December. If he can get another 10% out of that boat, they're gonna become real challenges for this America's Cup. It wasn't too long ago that we were questioning uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe's uh, I guess his mental state when it came to this team and what they were doing in the Christmas Cup. How was the relationship going between these two guys? I give them heaps of credit for just sticking with it, sticking with the plan. I mean, that was near disaster last year. 2021 has been a good year. We hope it's a good year for the whole world. It's been a really good year for these two guys. I honestly wonder whether we just all fell for a little bit in the sense, in the sense that this team that we are looking at right now knew exactly what was coming and what could unfold once they found the way to get all the right bits and bobs on. And as Nathan once described uh, in our commentary, once that bit goes right, the next bit goes right, the next bit goes right. And they knew what was coming. And this is just all the plan. And we're seeing their plan unfold. <laughs> no response? I don't know. I don't I'm know thinking about what I should say to that comment. I think, I don't think anyone, including that team, thought they were going to struggle so much last year in December. And I think it was the rocket that that team needed to to be bold and be brave with some of their decisions moving forward. And, you know, they got a lot of help and assistance from lots of different parties. And that's why my question to Ben, I think, is the most important one is, what are you going to do now you've got yourself a bit more time up your sleeve. Do you have the same upgrades coming or are you actually happy with the performance of that boat? And he kind of indicated that they want to make that boat go quicker, but maybe they don't have as much up their sleeve as they had before. Thank you both for not answering the question and just pushing it to the back of the queue. Shirley Robinson on the water. How big a deal at this point in the America's Cup is this win for British sailing? Stephen, you could tell, couldn't you, speaking to Ben, how much this meant. I mean, what a roller coaster of a couple of months. And and I think they have a, a belief on that boat that give them give them the equipment, equal equipment, then they can perform uh, on the race course. And, and we've seen that even today, you know, a little bit wounded, but competitive. And, and they never gave up. They fought till the very end. So massive belief here. It's a big and uh, but, you know, you heard from Ben, his eye is very much on to win the America's Cup and they will not stop. They will not stop believing and they will not stop making upgrades. Um, a really important win for this team. Thank you, Shirley. Union Jack flying proudly on one of the spectator craft heading back in. It has been a good day and they just can sit and soak it up. Let us take you back now to the actual race between Luna Rossa, Prada Pirelli and Enios Team UK. After a long, long wait to wait for the weather to settle in and actually wait for a little delay so Enios could try to fix their Cunningham situation, we had an amazing start. Two boats that were at one stage early, at one stage late, but just nailed the start. Absolutely on time with a classic match race start. Up, up, Leg one, this is a big move. But look at Prada crabbing to windward. Look, it looks like they almost go, go to windward, strangely dead up wind. They force Ineos into attack in a down speed mode, going slower than they wish. They come off the foils, first game, first pass to Prada. They get themselves out ahead. 
Really nice little match race move by Jimmy Spithill. But they have a crummy tack right up at the top gate. It allows Ineos to get to the inside, round to the inside, and off we go, Nathan. This this is just the beginning of what turned out to be a crazy boat. Yeah, it was, it was, it was action-packed, wasn't it? And just here we thought, oh, maybe Ineos are going to get away and, and extend, but it didn't happen that way. Luna Rossa took the lead on the, the next upwind, and you can see how shifty it was. The angles of the boats are changing all over the place. And right now, Ineos, you know, they need to find something to get back into this race, and they, they actually tack and they split the course and they head out to the right and close the gap at the top mark. These are the bearaways. These is the... The issue that American Magic had the other day, that heel, that lured heel is the helmsman's worst nightmare, having that rudder pop out and losing control, but it was fine in the end. And again, Ineos just kept chipping away, kept chipping away and got so close here that Prada believed they couldn't make the tack and keep the lead, so they had to give up the right-hand side of the course, which ended up being the favoured side of the course in this situation. Breeze shifts right a bit, and then... Uh, coming down to the finish here it, it was it wasn't an easy win it looks easy right here but it was that intersection further up where uh, they made that tight cross and there you go happy boys and ben telling him to calm down. calm down it's a long way to the big show they've got to win the prada cup to face the defender on march 6. And there is the Auckland ports and all the spectator feet heading back in towards their docks to celebrate or commiserate with each other, whoever they have been supporting. I've got to say, the one word that comes back to me when you talk about the issues they had with the cunning in before the pre-race start, that word reliability is still stuck in my mind, how strong, basically how strong Rita really could be. Yeah, the reliability is everything on these incredibly, uh, incredibly complex machines. We've seen people win, win and lose legs and win and lose races. That could have cost them a race, but they didn't allow it to. They had, they had a bit of a plan, and the plan worked. And here we go, off to the Prada Cup finals. So you can see. In your foreground there, Sir Ben Ainsley talking to the boss, Sir Jim Rackloff. It's 170 years of hurt. That's all the motivation Ben needs. The Enios Team UK skipper is hoping to make history and bring the trophy back to the UK for the first time since they lost it. That was way back in 1851. I think the thing I love about sailing is the diversity of the sport. You know, there's always a different challenge and that you're always learning, you're always developing new skills. And of course, you're out there on the water. We all love being out there on all the challenging mother nature. So uh, I think it's the most fantastic sport. First memory I had of the America's Cup was, I guess back in 87 in Fremantle. You know, I think it's gone down in history as one of the best cups, just because you had the Fremantle doctor, you had 20, 25 knots of wind. At, Every day, it was, I think, the last cup where they raced in a 12-meter class. The America's Cup is America's again. It's the fourth successive victory in five days, ending the shortest America's Cup in 100 years. I was a 10-year-old watching it on the telly uh, back home in the UK. That and the 92 Olympics in Barcelona, those were probably the two big sporting events which I, I remember as a youngster and really gave me the inspiration to try and learn more about sailing, be better at sailing, and, and perhaps that one day have the opportunity to race in an Olympic Games or to race in an America's Cup. So I'm, I'm very fortunate that, you know, that, that's, come, that's come true. One, four, down. Turning. That's pressure. It is just a little light. I guess I'm a pretty competitive person, uh, like most sportsmen. You know, I love the competition, really. I mean, I enjoy the whole process. I enjoy the learning and the development, but I really love racing. You know, I'm not particularly good at, at losing, but that happens, unfortunately, from time to time. The trick, I guess, is not to make a habit of it. I mean, in any walk of life, you probably learn more from your losses, don't you? And that's the same in sports, certainly the same in America's Cup. And you've got to have that determination and that motivation to keep going until the job's done. 
don't like giving up on on uh, on targets or on goals. So yeah, I think the trick is to set up the right organisation that can go that has longevity, continuity, and that way you keep learning, you keep developing, and step by step you get there. Yeah, I think if I could if I could hand over my five Olympic medals and take home the America's Cup, I think I'd probably take that trade uh, because everything it means to the team here, the amount of effort people are putting into this campaign and, and the campaign before and the history involved, what it would mean for us in, in British sailing, yeah, I'd make that trade. Sir Ben Ainsley, four-time Olympic gold medalist, and the mum champagne comes out because they are through. Nice. Direct entry into the Prada Cup final. Who it's against? Wow. Smiles on board, Enios Team UK. Sir Jim Ratcliffe with the beard, the backer. Mr. Enios himself celebrating a milestone moment in this campaign. And, and <laughs> yeah, and why not enjoy it? Hats off at the wind blow through your hair. And Sir Ben Ainsley, what a moment. Uh, you, you've got to let these, these moments and lap them up, but it's not the big prize. As we look at a beautiful vista of Auckland City and the Waitamata Harbour and the Hauraki Golf, and just a reminder of the standings, Ineos Team UK directly through to the Prada Cup final. It will be Luno Rosa, Prada, Pirelli and American Magic sailing Patriot in the semi-finals. Will we have racing tomorrow? Well, there is a question over that one. We will let you know as soon as we know so this is how it's won just a quick reminder you start with three challenges in the prada cup then you get well a winner that goes straight through that's as you can see the prada cup final first to seven in the team uk and then it's luna rossa and american magic in the semi-final then one of those will face Enios in the prada cup the winner of that will face emirates team new zealand in the 36th america's cup match and whoever wins that well they can just smile all of the way to the bank and think about the 37th edition, but we are a long way off from that. We must talk about uh, American magic and the likes. I mean, they'll be watching this and going, okay, wow, this is, we, we know where we're going now and who we're up against. Here we go, let the, let the pundits, let the speculation begin, right? Between these guys are taking a few weeks off, couple weeks off, and now it's the Americans versus the Italians. And frankly, if I were a betting man, I would have, I would have bet a lot of money that that was not going to be this round of this best out of seven round in the semifinals, Nathan. I, I, I just, I think, I think the sailing world is a bit stunned that that is the two participants in this right now, especially based on their track record in that Christmas regatta. And, and uh, yeah, the Americans, they got to get back out there. That's the story now, right? How good are they going to be when they get back out on the race course? Well, you know, Terry Hutchinson made it very clear that they'll be back and they'll be ready to go, but are they going to be at 100% and um, are they going to have the motivation to, to push through, you know, to beat Luna Rossa? Kenny, what's your thoughts? Who, who are you going to pick for next weekend? Oh, I think they have the motivation and then some. I think they have some renewed motivation. Um, I just worry about the gremlins. I worry about the pace of their boat and they're, they're putting a whole boat back together again. There's bound to be little gremlins all over the place. We talk about them on a, on a boat that is up to speed 100% on Ineos today. What's it gonna be like with a boat completely rewired, a new canting system, all, all new systems to, uh, to, make, to make that boat work? I don't, I don't know, That's, that would be my biggest fear. We're going to find out the moment they hit the water if their boat is, is working fine. And tell you what, I can't wait for next weekend. I think what we got, I think what we got today is what everybody has been waiting for with these AC 75s, and that was bang on match racing. And them two teams absolutely going for it. And now this team, Ineos Team UK, have a chance to sit back and as Ben Ainsley said yesterday in the press conference here in Auckland, uh, they have now bought themselves time and flexibility to put in upgrades and keep on getting ready for whoever they are going to face. Who will they face? Will it be Luna Rosa Prada Pirelli or will it be Patriot representing the New York Yacht Club after a full rebuild? Whatever it is, that team in front of you, Enios Team UK is directly through to the Prada Cup final.
Today's America's Cup Racing is brought to you from Auckland, New Zealand.